Hey, what's up? Hey. Okay. Um, so thanks again for agreeing to come on. Really appreciate it. Um, we had a lot of fun last time. I think we're going to have a lot of fun this time. Uh, for everybody who's been to an AMA before, you kind of know the drill. Um, questions go on the AMA question channel. Discussion goes in the discussion channel. If you want to speak to them directly, add VC to the end of your question. Um, don't troll uh, or you'll get banned forever. And you'll never come back. Um, Destiny, before we start off, uh, you want to give the people who might not know who you are, like uh, maybe like an intro, um, summary of what you're, what you're up to. Yeah, uh, I go by Destiny on Twitch and YouTube. I do probably half video games and then half like politics slash philosophy at this point. I'm probably a social democrat if you ask people on the right. I'm a neoliberal if you ask people on the left. But um, yeah, I exist somewhere in there. Pretty far left in terms of social and economic issues. And yeah, there you, there you go. That's about it. Cool. Okay, we're going to dive right into that. Uh, first question is from Safety. Turn Safety these off, virgin. Uh, will you ever run for public office, especially in a time when urban centers like LA are, are increasingly becoming more radicalized to the left? Um, fuck no. Uh, I just, I, I personally, I don't have the desire to, from a job point of view, it probably doesn't pay very well from like a logistics point of view. I would have to like cancel my Twitch stream or YouTube stuff because getting donations while being a public figure puts you in a really weird spot at the FEC. Um, you, you, no, <laughs> there's just the desire isn't there and the logistics would make it a nightmare to do. So. Cool. Okay. Next question from Stapes. Uh, do you think the statement race is a social construct is true? And how do you interpret what's, what a social contract, a construct even means in that context? Um, <clears throat> this is more complicated. This is a really complicated answer. I'm sorry. Okay, I'll try to do this quick. So pretty much every single category we have is a social construct, a computer, a car. Like cars don't exist in nature. That's a constructed category. We, you know, we label like a collection of parts that perform a certain function as a car, right? And the same is true of male or female, whether we're talking about gender or sex, really, right? Like the way that we group up certain traits and then the label that we give them isn't necessitated by physics or biology or nature or whatever. It's just what we decide to do. Uh, now, typically when somebody says, is something a social construct, um, I, I they can mean different things when they ask, um, when they ask, um, like, wh what does that mean, right? So race is something that is socially constructed, but I mean, obviously we construct things based on what we hope are true underlying physical, you know, or, or true underlying like facts of the world, right? So if somebody says like somebody is African-American, usually we're talking about somebody that is like black or if somebody is Caucasian, usually we're talking about somebody that's white, right? It's almost like by definition true, tautologically true, right? Um, so if you ask me, like, is, is race a social construct? I mean, like, the, the answer is obviously yes, but social constructs typically have, like, underlying facts that are that are true as part of them. Um, so the question is a, a little meaningless. I don't know who donated. It might If it's a person that's, like, looking for, like, a race realist answer, like, are, do black people have warrior genes? Is race real like that? I, I mean, I don't know. Race is as real as you want it to be. It just depends on how you define it. Um, for all the white nationalists that like to circle jerk today about, you know, if they're white and blah, 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 like, they literally do the we was Kangs arguments that they make fun of black people for, saying, oh, well, you think that Egyptians were black? Ha, <laughs> we was Kangs. But then they try to claim that, like, Nazis would like them, even if they're like fucking, you know, of like Serbian descent or some shit, which is clearly not true. The, the concept of white has changed over time. The concept of black has changed over time. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's there's a lot to dive into for that question. It just depends on the angle that you want to hit it from. Cool. Okay. Uh, next question is from one of our mods, uh, Chad. You're up. Okay. Um, so do you think your relationship with Trihex can be repaired, especially given how good it was and how it resulted in successful collaborations like the dt podcast i think a number of us missed that do you think that relationship can be repaired um yeah i mean i think me and him are cool now we just don't do anything at the moment um i got like a lot on my plate right now i don't know if either of us have time well i'm not sure about him but i don't really have time right now to like throw that kind of podcast like back on the table uh, but i mean like in terms of like showing up on shows together doing stuff in the future like yeah if we ever find something that we want to do I'm, I'm pretty sure we could so has the relationship between you and him been repaired for the most part, you think? Um, yeah, I think so. I we, I don't know if we've chatted privately yet, but I mean, like, we seem to be cool publicly. I don't have any ill will against him. He seems to be okay with me. Yeah? We just haven't really done anything together yet. Cool. Thanks, Chad. Um, next question uh, from Dude Nah. Do you feel like? Do you still feel like you're getting something out of your debates recently? And if so, which do you, which debate do you feel like this happened in? 
Um, debates are for like viewership and entertainment factor. I don't really get anything like intellectually out of most of my debates. Most people are super ideologically dug into their positions and they're not really willing to, not only do they not change their opinion, oftentimes they're not even capable of engaging with an argument. I, like my last discussion with Coach Red Pill is like a very good hyperbolic example of this. Uh, like people are typically really dug into a certain position they have. They don't really justify it in any meaningful way. So as soon as you present counter arguments, they just try to scream you down or they like try to block out anything that disagrees with their narrative and then, you yeah, know, whatever. Um, honestly, the most fruitful conversations I have are, are usually when like smaller un known people, you know, message me in chat. Like there are a lot of people in my community that have changed my views on certain topics just because they presented a lot of really compelling research. So that's probably where I get most of my, the benefit from debating or whatever. It usually comes from the research that I do in the pre-streams and the post-streams. Yeah. Um, now speaking of Coach Redpool, you know, he actually came back to the server and has like a voice on here now. I was really surprised by that because I felt like I was kind of a dick to him. Yeah, I mean, the guy is like, it's pretty, I, I, like, I hate to say this because it's really cringe to say this, but I mean, some people are very, very simple. Um, like, he really wants attention. Like, he, obviously, he, like, has a massive self-esteem issue. Um, anytime you get people that, especially men, um, anytime you get people that talk a lot about being alpha or beta or I fuck 19-year-olds and I'm 54, like, it's pretty clear that you not only have, like, big self-esteem issues, but you're trying to remedy said issues with some sort of, like, public acceptance. So I'm pretty sure that anybody that would give that guy attention would probably find, you know, him and their audience pretty quickly because he's, like, so thirsty yeah. for it. Like, like we call the channel, like, CRP's Hugbox, and he uses it. It's really confusing to me. But, yeah. like, I mean, I guess it works. Out. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Next question um, from Rage Pope. Uh, he wants to be unmuted. Um, okay. Rage. As soon as I can find you, you're unmuted. Where are you? Okay, Rage, go for it. Hey, uh, I was just uh, wondering if you thought the Fed was overstepping its bounds by providing yield curve guidance. If, if I thought the Fed was overstepping its bounds by doing what? <laughs> Uh, providing yield curve guidance and buying securities to make sure that the uh, interest rate yield uh, continues to be uh, in line with their expectations. Isn't that part of the Fed's like stated job is to like have influence over U.S. interest rates and everything? Uh, well, it's it's to uh, keep inflation low and keep unemployment high. That's not technically part of the job. It's to provide uh, yield curve guidance. Wait, to keep on to keep unemployment, unemployment high. Low. Unemployment uh, low, sorry, oh, at yeah. around 5%, and then the inflation low, 2% uh, is generally within the target. Doesn't investment stuff related to bond yields like have roundabout impacts on the market, like on the financial market and like liquidity of credit and everything, which would mean that like having influence uh, over that? I mean, for the short-term market, but uh, the point is the federal funds rate is supposed to be the mechanism for providing uh, that guidance, not by blindly um, just, uh, I guess, uh, interfering, intervening in the markets like they have been recently. Didn't we kind of like, I, I could be, I, this is like a little, obviously, you know, this is past me, you fucking cut because I know you're from my audience asking me this, but like, didn't we kind of leave that world behind in 2008 when they started doing the quantitative easing stuff? Didn't they take like more aggressive approaches to uh, like monetary Yeah, but this is like even beyond that, right? So this is like intervening in the corporate debt market. This is uh, intervening in foreign markets, providing like the FEMA repos to uh, not even just U.S. citizens, but um, mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, other countries as well. So uh, I'm just curious what you thought. So. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems kind of oversteppy, right? Because the Federal Reserve doesn't really answer to anybody. There's no oversight, and they kind of do things on their own. You know, like there's no congressional <laughs> approval. Um, it's pr it pr From a Democratic point of view, it's probably not good. From a logistics point of view, I don't know if I want Congress having any say whatsoever in monetary policy, although they probably should. So I don't know. What's your score right now? Uh, I am in the middle of a brutal game, so... Uh, a brutal? Oh my uh, god, you're a fucking angry. loser. Holy shit. <laughs> All right, get the word down. Get this guy out of here. Right, yeah. Okay, th thanks, Rage. Okay. <laughs> Next question. Um, let's go with... Uh, um, HT... I don't... Had, it's Tata HD. I'm going to... I'm going to Um... Is multiculturalism possible, or are there inherently incompatible cultures? What ought we do with incompatible cultures? Um, if there are incompatible cultures, can I have an example? Um, I mean, I'm sure there there must be some incompatible cultures, right? I, I'm sure that you can find examples of these. Uh, but I think like most mainstream cultures that exist today that have like a huge exposure to like Western media, like all probably fall like pretty similarly in line with like the major values today. Um, I have a hard time imagining that there are like any first world countries now whose cultures are entirely incompatible, um, even if there are slight differences between the two. Like you can go almost anywhere in the world now and like people under 30 can speak English to you. 
uh, you know, like a lot of people have the same music, a lot of people have the same TV shows, a lot of people know the same movies. Um, I, I would find it really hard to believe that like there are these massive, huge cultures that exist right now that are just totally clashing and incompatible with one another. I guess it just depends on how, I guess, intolerant or edgy um, some of the more traditional members of different cultures are. Like, I mean, like even people in Saudi Arabia are, are like flying off to other countries to go party and shit because even they're sick of the shit that exists in their own country. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I find it really hard to believe that like people, that, that some groups of people are so fundamentally different from one another that they just can't coexist. It seems hard to believe to me. Cool. Okay. Uh, next, next is uh, Dr. Goosh Goosh. Um, based on the recent sexual assault charges on Joe Biden, do you still believe all? Um, I the last cut off. I think you said believe all women. Uh, believe all women. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've never been part of the hashtag believe all women thing. I, that's a little cringe. Um, but I mean, I think that sexual assault allegations should all be taken seriously at the very least, of course. So I mean, like an investigation into this is yeah, totally warranted. I think. Okay, cool. Uh, let's go with uh, the Beholder now. Uh, Beholder, you are unmuted. Oh, uh, hi. Yeah, so my question is just, so I heard you were a rule utilitarian. Uh, could you just explain why you chose, you know, to judge, you know, consequences based on some rules rather than, you know, the acts that lead to um, I could be totally wrong here and I might be butchering all of ethics because fuck philosophy, but it feels to me that like in order to say if an action is intrinsically good or bad, you need some form of like moral realism to do that. It, it feels that way. Um, that if you're going to say like, oh, just doing this by virtue of this action itself is probably a good or bad thing, um, which I, I'm not, I don't know. I don't really feel on board with that. I'm a big, like moral relativist. I don't really believe in any like absolute concrete moral rules. So I, yeah, I don't know. I guess that's probably why I move towards consequentialism more than deontology. I see. So, so I would you say that like for you know a, a good society, right, would make you know its laws or rules perhaps you know such that they maximize utility in general. Um, I mean that would be my argument. Yeah, I don't know if most humans are okay with that, which would mean that the society wouldn't function if they weren't. But I mean that's how I would look at things. Yeah. All right, but um, so this is this is my question then, right? Uh, when when we're talking about ethics, we're not necessarily talking about what a society ought to do, but like what is actually good or bad, right? So like, I can argue that perhaps it's best um, for a society to use some rules, right? And that might maximize, you know, the utility and its consequences rather than acts simply because people, you know, would not be comfortable with some sort of act-based utilitarianism uh, implemented into law. But, you know, could, couldn't you say, right, that, like, I also want to, I'm, I'm, I want to hear your stance on agent neutrality, right? That's, that's really what I came for. Um, do you think that we should, like, judge people based on, you know, whether they conform to these rules of utilitarianism? Um, well, so the first question in terms of like what society ought to do versus what's good or bad um, seems like these are these questions are posed at different levels of ethics, like in terms of like figuring like what is goodness, like what is good or bad? That seems to be like a meta ethics question. And then what a society ought to do could be either like a normative ethics or applied ethics question. I think they're like looking at different levels of ethics um, in, in terms of like agent neutral stuff. Uh, I, I, I'm not familiar with the term. Can you catch me up on this? Yeah, sure. So so one argument, right, that I would make for act utilitarianism is basically uh, we can say, right, that, you know, a consequence is good, right, if it maximizes utility, okay. and if it's bad, right, if it doesn't. Um, you know, generally, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're talking about, like, hedonistic utility or preference utility or whatever utility, right? Um, in this case, I, I would argue that... You know, it just tends to maximize utility in the actual consequences, you know, if we were to implement rules, right, for a society. Because if we weren't, people would be fearful of, like, some guy, right, killing them to take their organs to give to a surgeon to save five people, right? Um, that's not really going to happen in a rule-based society. Uh, so you could just say, right, that, you know, for, for practical ethical purposes, right? You want to use rules, but normatively, you you would say that this this adheres to some sort of act. Resident sleeper. What? 
what the description of, or i guess what i'm I, what i'm not understanding is it sounded like the description that you gave i think was was world utilitarianism right but then you said that that ends up being act utilitarianism or can you explain that what do you mean by that right so so basically the rules exist insofar as they promote good uh actual consequences right so mm -hmm. So actual consequentialism, right, is basically what we what we're referring to when we're talking about the act part of utilitarianism. Yeah. So like we're looking yeah. at the actual consequences, whereas with rule utilitarianism, right, it will look at how the consequences conform to some rule yeah. that you make, right? Whether yeah. it be the intention of the action, or you know whether you foresee the action, or whether you know just think that in general some rules would maximize utility. Okay. Uh, okay. we can still use these rules, right? Practically, right? We're not forcing people to, you know, uh, do whatever action always maximizes utility simply because when we, when we broaden our scope, right, we think it would maximize utility far more to use rules. So, so the, the simplest way to describe this, right, would be the rules exist insofar as they produce actual utility. Yeah. Do, would you agree with that? Yeah, by definition, I think, right? Okay, so normatively, right, you believe in some sort of actual consequentialism. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess, right? Because rural utilitarianism is a subset of utilitarianism, which is a subset of consequentialism, right? Right. It's 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 what I'm what I'm saying, right? Is in normative ethics when we talk about actual consequentialism, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're usually referring to some sort of act utilitarianism on a normative level. That doesn't mean that we can't have rules in society. So I was just trying to figure out what you believe, you know, on a normative ethical scale, right? And it seems that, you know, you do believe that we should apply utilitarianism through rules, right? So that would be a form of applied rule utilitarianism. But, you know, you still have some fundamental belief in the actual consequences being good or bad. Sure, yeah. So that, that's all I was yeah. trying to get to. So, yeah, so on, on some level, right, it, it kind of... Uh, um, your rule utilitarianism seems to uh, fall back onto act utilitarianism. That's what I was really just trying to prove. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, that's, I guess it's possible that that's true. Um, it feels a little reductive, I guess. I feel like there must be some fundamental difference between like, so for instance, in the example of like, can you kill one person to save five lives at a hospital? Um, you know, because that would be the utilitarian thing to do. It seems like there should be, there ought to be some way to distinguish between saying yes or no to that. Right. Well, you would say, right, that in the action itself, if we were just looking at this like in a vacuum, right, mm -hmm. it might be a good thing to do that. However, you know, if we're if we're really expanding the, the picture here, it's probably not a good thing to do that. Right. Because, you know, people people will be fearful of that happening to them and people will generally just be, you know, unhappy because it happened. Sure. Um, sure. You know, but. It, in a vacuum, right? It does make sense, right? To do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I th I think I understand you there. Yeah, I I feel like the rule you tell, I feel like the rule part is still good to kind of clarify, maybe. But I, I mean, I think for the most part, I, I agree with you. And in, in like a really macroscopic way, rule utilitarianism essentially collapses into act utilitarianism by definition, right? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I I probably wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah. All right. Thank All right. you. Okay. Thank you, Beholder. Okay, now dragging us uh, firmly out of philosophy territory, um, it's Mr. Cube. Uh, has any music had an impact on your political beliefs, political, um, or like political bands like Rage Against the Machine, Morrissey, Dead Kennedys, etc.? Um, no, never, not at all. Cool. Okay. Uh, reasonably so. I mean, it's maybe listening to Linkin Park in my early years made me more energy. But like, as far as I'm aware, no, I don't think I've ever changed politics or had political shifts due to listening to bands or songs. Cool. Okay. Uh, next question from 93 of the Black Pill. Um, how does it feel your arguments got dismantled by John Zerka's flat earth uh, intelligence? I don't think anybody that listens to that feels like he dismantled my arguments. He pretty much pivoted from one topic to the next as soon as he couldn't answer something until he found some obscure piece of physics knowledge that I couldn't counter. This is typically how most like conspiracy theory debates work. Okay. Um, from Demang, uh, Sultan of Norge. Uh, how do you feel about Hassan calling you a Weasley little liar? <laughs> That's a good ass meme. Okay. Uh, next is a uh, charm hole. Charm, you are eventually unmuted. There you are. You're unmuted. Go. Charm. 
Charm's not there. Okay, well, Charm's question was, um, as a gamer, what do you think about the sudden about the use of the word uh, game fill, and uh, as well as the sudden shift from game journalism into direct content consumption, uh, a la gaming stream? What do I think of the word? Did you say game fill? Yeah, game, game feel. feel. Sorry, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Cool. What does that? What does yeah. game feel mean? Well, I, well, so I see you playing like say a lot of, uh, you know, Kerbal Space Program and uh, Oxygen Not Included and trying to like really understand like basically I'm trying to separate game as a media from all the other forms of media. So like if I'm trying to say find like the Sopranos of video gaming versus something that's way more functional that like actually teaches you something, like I feel like oxygen not included does like i don't know do you have a lot to say about that or that some games can be educational or well i mean not just educational like i mean you've i mean more or less you've created your entire career around gaming right like... yeah in the early days for sure although now i'm probably i probably gain more due to political related stuff now than gaming related stuff but yeah. yeah, so uh, it's interesting that like we've seen a massive shift in gaming journalism over the past few years, right? Like the whole Kotaku and action shit. Luckily, all that gamer gate stuff kind of you know went away, uh, more or less, you know. <laughs> and uh, but so now we're seeing like say Valorant, like it might not be the best game, but like it's the biggest game on Twitch at least, right? Like what well, is right now because they've got like drops enabled, so a lot of people are opening streams to watch to try to get bonus shit, right? Everybody will show up for free stuff. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, so capitalism, I don't know, casinos, bad, fun, whatever, you know, what have you. Like, I could get into it. Like, I had a good on conversation here about just how genocide simulators are just so prevalent in video game culture. Wait, what's that? what do you mean nice by genocide see... simulator? What does that mean? Wow. A gen... Well, uh, so we made a really long list of just any game that more or less within the gameplay forces you to commit some type of genocide. Like, obviously, Halo, but even Super Smash Brothers does, or Super Mario Brothers, rather. Funnily enough, like, Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter don't because it's more, like, MMA-based, so nobody really dies. Like, you're not committing, you're not killing certain type of people. You're just trying to beat them, right, knock them unconscious to then slaughter the evil. But if you're going to be playing Doom, Doom is obviously very, very much so a genocide simulator. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Okay. Wait, so what's the, (laughs) wait, so what is the question I'm looking for? I just I don't know you you don't really seem to talk about that a lot like you don't seem to do traditional gaming journalism well in terms of like I mean like if I were to speak specifically to the genocide simulator one right like I don't know if I would agree with the use of the word genocide there like genocide implies that you're targeting like a specific group of people I think this can encompass like a nationality definitely an ethnicity I'm pretty sure a religion um, like that these types of groups of people are targeted that's considered genocide but usually like the, the moral weight of a genocide is bad because we consider genocide to be bad because you're targeting a group of people for no reason like it's a bad type of genocide um, or, or genocide seems to be inherently bad because we're targeting people that shouldn't be exterminated but when you talk about like doom and you're killing like a race of demons who are hell bent on like enslaving, you know, all of humanity and causing them to suffer eternally to harvest their bodies for energy. I don't know if people would agree with the use of the word genocide there, or rather maybe they would say you're genociding them, but you're removing all the moral weight from the word, which makes it kind of weird, I guess. I don't know. Well, isn't it kind of taking away from the definition when you have so many simulators that I mean, they don't tell you specifically, oh, you're going to be slaughtering these type of people in mass for no reason. You're doing it to win. You're doing it. You must flick your fingers and your digits in a certain way to destroy this type, this covenant, right? Or this type of people like the guy in Far Cry 5, like you're going to kill his people. Like, there's no question about it. And then he nukes, spoilers, he nukes everything because he's like, no, fuck you. Like, this is how you genocide. Isn't, right? aren't, aren't games like that? So I think I only played Far Cry 3. Aren't games like that or Halo, aren't these normally done like in a defensive manner though? I didn't play like all the later yeah. Halos. So, so like, aren't you normally like, this is like a group of people that's trying to exterminate the human race and you're trying to like fight back against them rather than just like you're going through space like you're on the fucking USS Enterprise right. looking to exterminate alien species or something? Well, and we talked about that. We basically came to the conclusion that it's like genocide for genocide, right? It's like, 
oh well you stepped on my lawn so y'all are dying right like well but that's I mean, not you, that's not at, just stepped on my lawn like at the end of halo 3 right there's like only a billion humans left like most of mankind has literally been exterminated post 9 11 propaganda yeah, I, I i know i know i'm well aware of the halo series no but even if you just look at the super mario series you know you need to crush the koopas you, you have to you're not you you can mostly jump around them but even then you must like step on his children in order yeah, but the to... Koopas literally exist there. They antagonize you, and they're there. They'll kill you without provocation. They're violating the non-aggression principle Cringe, bro. at every single step of their existence. And it seems like all of them serve only to exist to capture like Princess Peach. Like, well, because it was their land. It's not the monarchist land. It's not the queen. You know, it's weird that she's princess. Like, if she's princess, who's the queen? Her mom. <laughs> yeah, true. Wait, that's not. Wait, is that Luna? I, I don't I don't know the Mario lore. Either way, thank you so much uh, for having me. This has been a great time. Please unban me uh, from your Discord. I really appreciate it. All right, I'm working on it. Okay, th thanks, Charm. Okay. Um, well, if you're gonna do that, unban me too. By the way. Okay, moving on. Uh, next question. Me too. Uh, why are you guys all banned? From... <laughs> Jesus. The, your mods are very mean to me. Next your question is uh, from Demonk. Um, Demank. I don't know how to say your name. Uh, do you still think it's acceptable to say the n-word in private? I think that there's a different standard that you use for public and private jokes. Um, whatever you say in private is your business. Try to be responsible with it. It's been my stance. It'll probably always be my stance. It's always been my stance. It's currently my stance. Cool. Okay. Next question is from one of our mods, uh, Nocturnal Animal. Um, why do you protect just chatting so vehemently um, to the point of you having issues with train wrecks? Um, I know you think you are under some, you are some ultimate arbiter of the truth, uh, who must never not say the truth, even if you're friends with that person. But you clearly came into that conversation with uh, aggression. I don't, I don't defend just chatting at all. I'm, I, I mean, I just, I think it's kind of funny how people on the internet shit on women so hard. I think it's pretty gross sometimes. Generally, most of my criticisms have to do with like the misogyny that kind of like runs pretty rampant in trans community. It's not like defending just chatting. I don't, I don't really give a fuck about that section. I mean. Okay. Uh, next question is from Oi. Uh, he wants to speak. Oi, you are eventually unmuted. I oh, know this time, and I think you left the voice channel. Okay, I'll just ask this question. Um, do you not think that memeing about misinformation related to the Corona mask wearing is a pretty harmful? I, listen, I stand by everything I said. If you want to wear a mask, that's fine. Don't pretend that wearing a mask is going to confer you some magical protection. There's other precautions that are important to take that are more important to take. I stand by everything I said, okay? Okay. Um, next question from uh, Stapes. Stapes, go ahead and... All right. So let me find my question really quick. Right. So I know in the past... Um, you know the debate with no bullshit, pretty famous. Um, it's pretty great content. But you've done it before. Um, it's telling when you do the incest debate with people. You know, they you can very quickly see if someone's being intellectually dishonest. And I know in one of those debates, um, you said that you had reasons against it that were rational, that weren't in that circular where it's, it's like it could cause a birth de deformation. Well, then obviously you could have protection. Um, so what are those rational reasons that you um, mentioned? From like a moral standpoint, in my opinion, like the, the, the only real reason you can have if you want to oppose and put up a coherent argument for why incest should be like not tolerated in society is because it's possible that the normalization of incest between siblings could lead to the normalization of incest between siblings in the household, which is almost always going to have power imbalances because of an age difference, which could then further lead to the uh, normalization of incest between like parents and children, which is almost always going to be incredibly horrible for um, for all parties involved, especially the child. So like if you were going to try to say like it should never happen, it would be because you're looking downstream at some of the other things that could possibly be normalized from there, assuming it's not a slippery slope. That, that would be like the right. big argument against it. To be clear, though, when people use that as an argument, right, the slippery slope or power mm -hmm. imbalances, you said that was a, um, like, normalization fallacy, saying because power imbalances are a bad thing right now, it's like, um, uh, your example was, if, if, uh, if a relationship between two people had a power imbalances, would that be bad? And I mean, not all power answer. imbalances are necessarily bad. Um, I mean, they can be. You can deal with them responsibly. 
Um, it just depends. Um, I, I mean, like almost every single relationship is going to have some form of power imbalance, um, whether it's by physical size, whether it's by access to money, um, whether it's by family status. Like there's always going to be some sort of imbalance. Um, you just hopefully try to minimize those. Or if those imbalances do exist, you try to like responsibly uh, confront them, basically. Right. Yeah, I agree. Fair enough. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sam. Uh, next question from Dr. Goosh Goosh. Um, do you support parents giving children hormone blockers? Um, if a child is having questions about that related stuff and the APA's position on it is that they recommend puberty blockers for uh, an adolescent to spend a little bit more time to figure out you know, what they want to do with themselves, assuming that there's a great deal of harm that's minimized by preventing somebody from going through puberty as the gender that they feel doesn't match their assigned sex at birth, um, yeah, I'm fine with it. Um, with, with, wherever the research stands on that is typically what my position is going to be. Cool. Okay. Uh, next is uh, Punt. What are your thoughts on the second generation of refugees in Norway having a lower unemployment uh, rate than native Norway? Uh, having a, I don't know the specifics of immigrants in Norway, so I couldn't answer that. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Um, I know that, like, I don't know if it's similar in Norway than Sweden. I know that in Sweden, I don't remember why. I would have to go read up on this again. But I think for Sweden, there were, like, pretty specific reasons why a lot of immigrants couldn't get jobs. That, like, if you immigrated to the country as either a refugee or in some other status, that, like, you weren't allowed to work for a year or something, or the requirements were such that they weren't able to do it. So it ended up leading to, like, a really high population of unemployed immigrants that just weren't allowed to work and then ended up on welfare rolls. It was, like, really strange. I would have to go back and read about that. But, I, I mean, I don't know the immigration and employment policy of immigrants for every single country on the planet so i'm not sure cool okay uh, wait did you delete him. hold on we got a guy in chat hellstorm are you deleting his questions no i don't think so okay he's talking a lot of shit that dude looks real fucking mad okay sorry keep going i'll meet you right now hellstorm let's say where i was deleting this question <laughs> oh no well, let's let's go for it okay is he even in the voice channel i don't even think he is whatever if we can if he wants to come on he can come on oh no there he is okay hellstorm go for it yeah, he's here. Oh, there's no debate. Destiny would be normally banned by the rules of the server, and you paid him to be as a guest. Oh, it's a different critical position. Holy shit, wait, I'm getting paid for this? Yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, you pimped him out. You said yesterday that you pay people to come on the server for appearances. I assume that's the case, because Destiny doesn't do anything for shock value. For oh, shock no, value? No, wait, 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 wait. Hold on, wait. Do anything for shock value? First of all, I do a lot of free appearances, okay? I do shit for doobie sometimes. It's fine. Oh, I don't good. You appearances. promote your ideas for charity. That's great. <laughs> Who says would, I'm promoting anything for charity, for dog? I'm streaming this. I get paid to stream. So you are getting paid. You just said you do it for free, and then you said you get paid. You implied yeah. earlier that I was getting paid by Doobie. I get paid to stream on Twitch. Doobie is not okay. paying me. Does any of that okay. confuse you? Okay, you do it for a living. That's great. Your positions would normally get you banned on the server. That's all I have to say. Wait, so are you telling me that in this server, that if you say bad jokes privately, that you actually investigate the DMs of every single person on the server? Is that what goes on here, Doobie? They, they have. Re they no, have? we don't. <laughs> Hey, hey, here's no. the. Uh, I, I actually don't know what you're re referencing. Like, which position do you think would get him banned? Saying the hard R in private. If you say it too much to somebody in private chat, you can get him reported on the server and banned. For it. Well, don't get me. Wait, first of all, server drama. I was just saying that by the rules of the server, Destiny would normally. Wait, hold on. Firstly, my my posi First of all, you don't even know if I say the hard R privately. Okay. Firstly, okay. Secondly, weren't you confirmed by other people having said it? There was like a two-hour compilation of this on Twitch where you said numerous times you said it in private. I said, generally, my position is that I defend it, okay, but in so terms of me actually... Are you okay, dude? You sound, like, really fucking mad. I don't think anybody's ever reported me oh, anywhere. Oh, bro. The standard Gish Gallop opening. Go ahead. Oh, God. All right, okay. I think I'm good. <laughs> this guy is so fucking mad. <laughs> so, so to be clear, right? You Gish Gallop or logical fallacy, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Just a yeah, little softer I, I paper. Know. I don't investigate people's like private DMs if it's ever set up your hard art, right? Yeah, no, it's okay. I just saw the guy being, like, super totally ultra fucking like, asshole. Like, to be clear, I say the hard R in private sometimes because it's funny. Like, Dude, what the fuck? Same, I'm, I'm, bro. Just, I'm just a man, okay? I'm a brown man. I've got the, the N-word pass. That's how, that's how Basically, me too. I'm also brown. Um, I get it. Okay, we're moving, moving on. Okay, um, go for it. Next question. Savitar. Actually, let's go with Doughboy. Doughboy has a couple of these. Uh, I'm going to unmute you. You're, you're unmuted. Go. Uh, hey, Destiny, I, I love your videos. Um, are international sanctions generally successful at bringing geopolitical adversaries to negotiation, or would you be in favor of other methods? Um, the 
I, I'm unfortunately I just don't have a good history. So the only international sanctions that I like am like a little bit more familiar with is I know that we sanctioned the fuck out of Iran. I know that we sanctioned the fuck out of Cuba. Um, and then I know that we um, sanctioned the fuck out of um, Bosnia. Um, it, but like I, I'm only familiar with like a few intimate examples. I don't know in general mm -hmm. like how effective it is on like a larger basis because I've never looked at like any meta analysis in terms of like how well do sanctions bring people into the fold. So like if you would ask me that question on tariffs, I know that generally tariffs are unsuccessful because they're implemented in non-economic ways for political reasons and then they're often backed off for it for political reasons. Like I've seen a lot of different like meta analyses that look at those like empirically. But in terms of um. In terms of like international sanctions, I'm only aware of like a handful of, of like anecdotes, not anecdotes, but like a handful of examples. Um, like I know like Bosnia stuff was like very successful, but that's because it had a lot of military pressure backing it. Um, the Cuban and the Iranian stuff seem to not be as successful, unless by successful we mean that like it hurts their economy, but it doesn't seem to like make them any friendlier towards us. Um, so I, yeah, I just I don't really know the answer to that in general. It's a good question. I, I probably should look that up. But. Thanks. I have one more question. Um, can you clarify your stance on free speech and spreading intentional misinformation? I think spreading intentional misinformation or grossly negligent information is like about as wrong as anything can be. Like I value that more than hate speech. Um, I don't think you, you, I mean, personally, you shouldn't be hateful in public. I don't think, but if you are hateful in public, it's whatever. But when you start spreading like, like, misinformation or stuff that's just genuine generally i'm sorry genuinely like untrue or, or you're like grossly misinformed on something so like anti-vaxxers and stuff like that um I, I think you're doing just like a net harm to public discourse i don't think there's any value in your speech there and i think you're just hurting like all of society in the world um thanks i have one last question do you buy the argument that uh the solution to a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun um, I mean, in the right place, it can be, sure. Okay. I mean, also the solution to, like, a suicidal person it could be a suicidal person with a gun that kills themselves. You know, like, the solution to, you know, like, a, a kid, you know, taking too much of your money can be him finding your gun in a closet and killing himself. Like, I mean, like, the, like guns solve a lot of problems, and not all of them are, are, are quote-unquote problems that need to be solved. Um, I, I mean, like, in the right place at the right time with the right user, a gun could be, like, a really cool thing. Um, we've seen, everybody's seen videos of that on the internet. But then also, like, just the presence of a firearm in the house increases your likelihood to commit suicide, like, twofold or something. It's like, or it maybe even more. It's a massive increase. Um, children find guns and they kill themselves. Um, abusive spouses will kill them. other people with guns. Like, yeah, I mean, like, there's a lot of drawbacks that we don't seem to account for when it comes to firearm possession in the U.S. But... Cool. Thank you, Dopa. Uh, next question from uh, Case: Does Omni Destiny believe in God? No, not at all. Okay. Uh, next to Ace, uh, do you stand with Israel? Um, not in particular. No. I mean, it's from like a U.S. interest point. It's good to have allies in the Middle East. Um, but in terms of like their treatment of the Palestinians um, or Netanyahu and and his aggression towards Iran and stuff, um, I'm not necessarily in favor of that. But I mean, Middle Eastern stuff is the, all of that is like really complicated. Um, but I'm not like a huge like Israel stan, as good as it is to have like allies in the Middle East. Cool. Okay. Next question is from uh, Janama. I'm not really sure how to pronounce. Uh, ever since you've talked to Dr. K, an Harvard psychologist, mm -hmm. have you changed your attitude towards emotions? Um, not really. I, he's a cool guy, and I respect and appreciate everything he says. Uh, maybe in the future I'll think more about it. But, I mean, I think I function pretty well as I do right now. Okay. Um, next is uh, mayonnaise. What was your favorite debate? My favorite debate ever? Um... I don't know. I like different debates for different reasons. My last one with Eric Stryker was really funny. I thought like the guy like unintentionally stumbled his way across like six topics that for like really random reasons, it felt like um, if you've ever seen the movie Slumdog Millionaire where he's playing who wants to be a millionaire and every question he's asked, there's like some part of his life where he has like the answer. Like Eric Stryker basically ended up playing that game with me, which is really funny. Um, so I mean like that debate was really funny and a lot of fun. Um, I thought I prepared really well for my debates with Lauren Southern and my debate with Nick Fuentes, my second debate with him. So I mean debates where I prepare really well for them. Oh, and my one for James Alsup, um, like when people start like citing sources incorrectly, and I'm familiar with like the source material, it is like feels really good. Um, in terms of like entertainment value, conversations that I've had with Coach Red Pill, that guy is like really funny to laugh at. Um, <laughs> Jesse bullshit. Lee Peterson. Um, Jesse Lee Peterson, yeah, is, is interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I, there's like a ton of different debates I like for different reasons. Um, you know, in terms of like picking out like a favorite, I mean, it would have to be like with respect to a certain value, I guess. Okay. Uh, next is uh, Java Bolt. Um, what are your thoughts on abolishing? 
Fuck, your mic cuts off at the end of a lot of questions. What are your thoughts on abolishing what? Uh, ice. Um, I don't know. I don't think, um, did, did Bush create ice? Um, I know it was, it's not like as old as some people think. Yeah, two, yeah no, it's not. I Because initially when somebody brought up abolishing ice, I was like, well, they're probably important. They probably serve a purpose. Okay, yeah, they so they were created in 2003. Apparently we didn't have ice before that, and it seemed like we did okay. Um, I... I, I I don't, I don't know enough about it to say like, so on it's like on an emotional level, I would like to just say like, oh, like, um, yeah, we should just get rid of ice, but it's possible that maybe some parts of like the FBI or some parts of like, um, border patrol, maybe those have been like reshuffled under ice now. So if we abolished ice, those would have to go back to being controlled by other agencies or something. Um, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't necessarily think, um, I, I'm not going to like, I think illegal immigration is bad in terms of like we can't just have people coming over and have no fucking idea who they are and then they wind up in places that are like you know I, i'd be much more open to like open borders before i would be to um like just letting everybody in illegally not tracking anybody um so at the very least we can like keep track of people coming in um so i mean like i think that ice can serve a purpose i just think that our immigration policy might be a little bit too restrictive right now and that's it's more that's the problem than ice's existence but okay uh next question from uh Remy Subi, some weeb. Um, the question is, um, what are your thoughts about the right to deny uh, deny gay marriages at church? Um, I personally would wish that they would accept every kind of marriage, but I don't feel it's acceptable to force my opinion slash beliefs on others, even if they're big, even if they have a bigot. Um, it's complicated. So churches should be able to marry whoever they want. Um, you don't have to marry gay people at a church if you don't want to. However. Churches also kind of sort of dip into the tax fund because they don't pay taxes. Um, so fuck you. Um, if, if you're going to be a religious institution and you're going to be, you know, get some tax exempt status, then you're probably going to be have to help. You're probably going to have to be held to some sort of public standard. Um, we don't let courthouses refuse gay people because gay people's taxes pay for courthouses. And, you know, we shouldn't let a church not marry gay people if they're going to be tax exempt and other gay people have to pick up their, their slack. Uh, if churches want tax exempt status, then they need to adhere to whatever our, our kind of like public decorum is. If they want to abandon tax exempt status and pay taxes, then they can do that. That's fine. Fine. Um, and then they can go back to discriminating against whoever they want, I guess. Cool. Okay. Next is Mo. Mo, you're on me. Hey, Destiny. Uh, long time, first time, yada, yada. Um, I have a question about generally how you got started streaming. Um, I know that when you first started streaming, you've said this before, like, oh, you just kind of got lucky or whatever. But I'm just really curious, like, how did you kind of force yourself to be motivated to keep up a streaming schedule? Like, I know it's not going to be, you know, 100% relatable for me, but for anyone who's kind of starting like their own business or like has an idea that they think would be really cool, like how, like what's kind of your tip for how to approach life in that scenario? Um, I, that I lucked into like almost everything I have. So I'm a really bad person to ask. Like, I don't really have a, the greatest of work ethics. Um, streaming is just really fun for me. Like, even if I, before I was streaming and even if I wasn't streaming, like I would still do the same shit. Like people post clips of me on YouTube sometimes because I'm a fucking nerd that'll go into discords and argue with people like at 2 AM and I'm not even streaming. Like, it's just fun for me. I like arguing with people. I like reading about politics and philosophy. Um, and I like playing video games. Like th th these are all fun things that even if I didn't have a stream, I would do anyway. You know, turning on a stream just means I get paid to do them. So like the, the motivation for me to stream is super easy because it's just something that I enjoy doing. And even if I stop streaming right now, like I would still continue to do all the same things anyway, although less because I'd be working. So, uh, But like uh, just real quickly, though, when you first started streaming, it probably wasn't as profitable for you. So like was that still like just a risk you're willing to take? Like, hey, I, I know I'm kind of wasting my time, but I don't really care. Was that kind of the thought process or? Um, yeah, I mean, I just streamed in my free time, basically. Like, I worked, I was a carpet cleaner, and I, between jobs, I would come home, and I would, like, stream maybe for an hour or two, or, you know, sometimes I had Sundays off, I'd stream on Sundays, or I would try to stream at night for a couple hours if I had time to. Okay, cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. cool. Thanks, man. Okay. Uh, next is, uh, Monophius. Uh, do you believe that the coronavirus Wait. is made up by the... Hold on. Oh, sure. Hold on, wait. Just hold on real quick. I'm sorry. There's a guy triggering me in chat. No if you if you want to say that there should be a separation of church and state and the state shouldn't be allowed to dictate to a church what their moral policies ought to be when it comes to marrying gay people, then that's 100%. You're cool to do that. But if you're getting tax-exempt status, fuck you and suck my dick. If you're going to sit there and leech off fucking taxpayers, you can't discriminate against groups of those taxpayers. It's super fucked up. You can't scream and cry about separation of church and state on one hand and then on the other hand go, okay, but hold on. We want the state to be involved in our taxes, right? Because I get married filing jointly uh, status 
you know, tax privilege status to the IRS. And also we want certain types of protections and tax exempt status filing for our, our, our religious organization. That's not separation of church and state. That's I want the state to be involved when it benefits me. And then I want the state to fuck off when I want ultimate freedom. That's bullshit. You can't, you can't have it both ways. It's one or the other. Okay. Sorry. Go. Go ahead. Your question. It's okay. Do you, you want to jump it on me? That guy is in the voice channel. It's up to you. Oh, I, if he wants to ask a question, I may go for it. I don't want to cut the other guy's yeah. question. though. sorry. No, it's okay. Um, binary, you're in meter. If you got a response. Yeah, see, the separation of church and state has nothing to do with uh, whether someone has taxes, exempt status or not. <clears throat> so th the main idea was the was the idea that the state cannot tell the church what to do, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I agree, the whole the whole thing, um, uh, gays can get married, whatever, that's fine, right? But do not dictate to a church what it can and cannot do within its uh, tenets. Or sure, else. then the church shouldn't have a tax-exempt status. It's easy as that. I don't see the, the correlation there. You are literally demanding that gay people pay taxes that cover an institution that discriminates against them. If a church is getting sure. tax-exempt status, then they should be held under anything that a corporation would be held under in terms of like the restrictions that they have placed against them. Like, Okay, so why should I pay taxes for something that uh, helps abortions happen? Um, I don't think that happens. Hmm? I don't think that it's, happens it's, it's, I don't, in terms same, of like any of the federal funding that goes right now towards um, any of the federal funding, for instance, that goes towards Planned Parenthood. That's not allocated for abortions. I don't think any money is sent towards abortions right now. But even but even if like, even if you did, even if you did want to make the argument that it was um, in the United States of America, abortion is like a federally constitutional thing. Like the Roe v. Wade already decided yeah. that. You mean it, you mean the courts decided not necessarily the Constitution, right? The courts come from the Constitution. So, yeah, the, the, the Constitution in a way does. Unless you think yeah, the courts so are unconstitutional. I, I still see it the same thing. The, the churches have uh, not allowed, some have not allowed gay marriage, um, you know, not perform them. Some have now. Yeah, but um, why would you collect so tax money from people and then discriminate against them? Like, do you don't think that's a little messed up? Tax money? They, it's, it's, we, they, we don't, they don't collect it directly, but like they get a tax exemption, which means other people have to pay more to make up for the same budget. Why should churches be allowed? Why should a church be allowed to do that while discriminating against part of the population? Why should the population dictate what a church does? Because the church is, is leeching off that population for tax revenue to, to make up for the tax revenue that they're not paying. Is a church a representation of the people? If it's, if it's getting tax exemption status, then to some extent it's become like part of the public. Yeah. As soon as you, as soon as you're on your knees begging for other people to pick the bill up for you, then yeah, there's going to be like an extra set of restrictions placed on you. Like, okay, fine. Like, if we're all going to pick up the tab, then there's a certain way that you have to act. You don't get to say, I want to discriminate against this group and that group and that group. While well, these people have to step up and pay your taxes for you, I think that's super weird. I don't know why you would ever think that would be like an okay arrangement. So, do they generate money? Are they corporations, or are they exempt under five hundred one c? They generate money, yes. It does, it does not generate revenue, though, right? Well, I mean, they generate revenue. They generate, they, probably, yeah, of course. Of course. Why are they tax exempt? Because they're uh, institutions of faith. There's like special tax exemptions for religions in the uh, IRS tax code. I mean, churches collect tithes, right? Like, or at least in Catholic church, we always pass the baskets around or whatever we service, and they collected money that way. I mean, they pay their bills. So, I mean, that's revenue, right? So the Church of, Scienti church of Scientology is, a tax, is tax exempt, right? But it doesn't afford anyone access to services, right? Um, I mean, I imagine that it's um, I imagine that it's tax exempt. I, I imagine, right? It's an official church. I don't know if that's a trick. Right? Maybe they're not yeah. officially recognized. Well, then, yeah. Well, I mean, then. I think that certain types of discrimination are okay, depending on, like, um, like uh, for instance, like if you have, like, an all-women's gym, that's probably fine, but if you're just discriminating against like a protected class, so something like sex or gender or um, or like veteran status or age or family status, and you don't have like like a, like a necessary for operations reason to do so, like for instance, like an all women's church couldn't exist if they let men in as well, right? Um, if you're gonna file for like tax exemption stuff, then yeah, you should probably be forced. You should be compelled to like not discriminate against said classes. Yeah. So I would say churches. Um... You would, would you agree? Uh, churches are exempt because they are charities, and marriage is not a service they actually offer. I mean, marriage seems to be a service that most churches offer, as far as I'm aware. What do you mean? What do you mean? It's a pastor. It's, it's a pastor. Who's, 
or the state. Uh, yeah, well, you got to get the license, right, from the state or county. The license comes from the state, but you can get married in a church, right? And a pastor can be licensed and everything to, like, do the paperwork yeah. on your behalf and marry you. Yeah, but it's a group act. Church is a group activity, right? De facto operation. Sure. It's a charity. Okay, even if it was a charity, what is? how does that change anything? That's why they're tax exempt. Okay. Are, are charities allowed to discriminate against gay people? <laughs> is that a thing that's happening? That that's happening? Yeah. I don't... yeah. Uh, well, if you want to call it that, yeah. So if I, if I had a charity? Church of Scientology. Church of Scientology. We can't, no one can just go in there and get services from them. Right? Well, hold on. Does the Church of Scientology, Scientology, does that explicitly discriminate against gay people? Or do they just have like a membership ritual or something you have to go through to get in? Because these are fundamentally it's, different it's, things. It's one or the other. It's the same thing. Think about it. It's it's totally different. If anybody could apply to join the Church of Scientology, then that's fine. It's okay if there's like certain things like a ritual or whatever you have to go through to get in. That's fine. But if the Church of Scientology is like, oh, we don't allow gay people here, well, then no. Then they should get tax exempt status either. You shouldn't make people pick up the bill for you if they're being discriminated by you. That's insane. Uh, so they are allowed to discri discriminate on how they use their money, right? Like a church, a, a nonprofit is, right? Uh, for instance, the Red Cross wants to discriminate on who they serve. They, they can do that retainer. retainers. Oh, hold on. I'm sorry. Okay, so the the Church of Scientology is not tax exempt in any size, shape, or form. They haven't been, they they haven't been tax exempt since 1968. So never mind. So the Church of Scientology isn't even a good example to use here. Um. So binary, are you all uh, you all done? Yeah. There's there's this. He just disagrees that he thinks that uh, the state can dictate to the church uh, because of a. a something like um well the, the thing is they can't <laughs> well why, why can't you wait why can't you phrase my argument correctly like you you weasel back into this like super dishonest position where you're like oh he just thinks the state can dictate the church but i don't think the state should dictate anything to a church a church is an incredibly private matter um but you're more than just a church when you go to the public and you beg them to pick up your tax bill like well now you've become like almost part of the public in a way because you're asking for tax exempt status like you're something different than just an organization of faith now like you keep missing that second part of the argument like it's just the, the big bad government man stepping on on your faith the problem is you're going to the big bad government man and saying please pay my bills for me i don't want i don't think i should have to pay these bills and also the people that are paying these bills i should be able to literally discriminate against some of them because of their sexuality it's vastly different than just the church being dictated to by the state you know what they ought to do should we force a pastor to uh, marry people who say he's a Christian pastor? He has to marry people who are Satanists. Should a Christian pastor have to marry people that are Satanists? Um, yeah, uh, like I don't know. Church, I'd have to think about it. They don't, they don't want to do it. I mean, it, it would depend on like, are they demanding like a different type of ceremony or something? Like, like if you're making demands that like a place can't accommodate. So like if a Satanist comes in and he's like, I want statues of fucking, ba I don't know what the name of the fucking horn demon guy is or whatever. If they're making like those kinds yeah. of demands, then probably no. But if they just come in and they're like, hey, we want to get married in this church or whatever. Um, then yeah, if they want to. Yeah, sure. Well, you, you're saying forcing them to with, you know, basically not giving them money. Um, yeah, if they're going to apply for tax exempt status, then yeah, they have to serve the public to some extent. Sure. So is, is the church owned by the state? Is the church owned by the state? Um, um to, to some extent you become a little public when you start asking for tax exempt status. Yeah. Yeah. Binary. I think all these things that like when you accept like money or benefits from the, from the state that comes with strings, right? Which is like this uh, one of those uh, you don't get to discriminate against gay people, for example. So it yeah. just seems like you guys have a disagreement about that, and I don't think uh, you're gonna get past yeah. that. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm kind of you know I'm really leaning towards the idea of getting government out of uh, marriage, you know, marriage license and things like that. You know. Yeah, that's I, I fine. That thing. I really question that thing, but you know, when it comes to church, marriage or not, um, I still I still cannot stand by the idea of allowing. Um, a for, a forcing a church to accept um it doesn't matter like it could be whatever faith it could be whatever the, the church should be like well, we can't do that here it's against our tenants whatever it is you can come up with anything yeah it's like forcing, totally. a mosque, forcing a mosque to um allow christian preaching to happen within us sure and to some extent i'm totally cool with that but when you start asking for tax exempt status then like i'm an atheist like well, fuck why would my tax money be going to cover an organization that discriminates against gay people like the fuck like i don't, I don't want to waste my money on that shit like that's weird like 
and more more so than just weird i guess like that's like discriminating against sections of the population that like if i was a corporation i wouldn't be able to get away with that right like if i was hiring and i was like you know we're not doing services for like i don't allow gay contractors to work for me like i would get the book thrown at me and i'm not even tax exempt like cool okay thank you binary oh also and to be clear um apparently from 1993 onwards um scientology did get tax exemption again um so they lost it in um like 68 but then they got it back in 91 so they are tax exempt now or that's my understanding. Sorry, just reading through this. Awesome. Okay. Next question from Small Power. Um, with a wider accessibility to gaming content, is there even a need or demand for gaming journalists, um, especially given their lack of connection to the gaming community as shown in the Cuphead controversy and the Verge PC building guide? Um, gaming journalists are people that try to get clicks on articles by including the names of newly released games um, in their headlines so that people searching for it might stumble across their articles. Gaming journalism is absolutely fucking worthless. Um, as a gaming journalist, you're obliged to give positive reviews to everything because if you don't, then shitty publishers, which means everybody, won't give you access to the games early to review. So you basically have to give good reviews. Gaming journalists themselves suck at video games. Oftentimes, they barely even fucking play through it before they review it. Um, gaming journalism is a fucking sham. You're probably better off picking like a YouTuber that you trust that you think does good games reviews and then going by you know like stuff on their channel um I, I think you're gonna have a way better time doing that than reading any article off of fucking ign or or some shit related to games cool okay next question is from a uh, chronic tantrum you are unmuted hello wait hold on i'm so sorry okay hold on uh, I, 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 hold on ask your question in two seconds somebody's saying your taxes aren't going to the church do you not understand tax law why is no one saying this he literally does not understand where his tax money is going it's definitely not going to tax exempt things so if we have to raise a hundred dollars in property taxes and there are 10 houses on the block and everybody pays ten dollars if one of your neighbors says hey i want to be tax exempt and you now have a ten dollar shortfall in your budget so you're only raising ninety dollars everybody else has to chip in like a dollar and, and eleven cents so now that dollar and eleven sense that every single extra person is paying is effectively being used to subsidize the tax exemption of house number 10. When I say that your money is quote-unquote going to a tax-exempt area, I don't mean that you're literally doing a cash transfer from taxpayers to the tax-exempt area. What I mean is that by them not paying, you have to have other people make up the shortfall in the budget by increasing the tax on them. That's what I mean when I'm talking about tax exemption. Okay, sorry. Ask your question. Jesus. Okay. <laughs> Chronic, you're admitted. Go for it. My main question is basically uh, how should we treat transgendered people? Because from the studies I've looked at, uh, they basically, every study that's been conducted on like a long-term follow-up study on transgender people that are going through treatment, like cross-sex hormone or sexual reassignment surgery, a lot of the studies, they sh don't really show positive uh, responses to the treatments. And most of the times they don't follow up after 10 years. And there are certain studies which I've, I've seen that when they look at uh, basically the effects of the treatment post 10 years of like surgery that the mortality rates more or less skyrocket compared to the controls of uh, of just controls of like the normal population so I, I'm wondering like how do how should we go about treating them or if there's some sort of treatment that we should be looking into more so than just saying that we should probably you know people that are have some sort of mental disorder we should just let them decide that they can uh, you know it's more or less self-mutilation by a doctor. Um, so self-mutilation doesn't really accurately describe a surgical procedure at all. It doesn't make sense to call it self-mutilation unless you're like super heavily loaded against the topic. Um, all of the longitudinal studies that I've ever been presented related to this all show an incredibly positive outcome um, regarding HRT, hormone replacement therapy, or SRS sex reassignment surgery for trans individuals. The only one that is oftentimes misquoted and misapplied that you might be thinking of is the one that Ben Shapiro commonly cites, and he butchers the citing of that study so much that the lead researcher involved with that has done an AMA on Reddit clarifying her position that it wasn't meant to investigate whether or not treatments were an effective way of addressing gender dysphoria in trans individuals. Um, trans people and their outcomes related to surgery all have to do with the types of support they get after surgery um, and like the environment around them like that's what her study was investigating um, whether or not you know like if a trans person um, 
you know, uh, undergo some, some surgery, some therapy, what are their outcomes afterwards, and then tracking that longitudinally. But that study was never designed to show or say that trans people um, l longitudinally have a bad outcome related to SRS or HRT. Like, as far as I understand it, unless something has changed very recently, um, the APA still has these as their recommended guidelines for al alleviating gender dysphoria. And generally, the APA is, is following, you know, what comes out of the major studies and the meta-analyses that are posted related to HRT and SRS. Um, I, it's possible that this exists out there and I've never seen it. I'm highly doubtful, but I'm not aware of any meta-analyses or, or there might be some individual studies, um, anything that shows that trans people have bad outcomes related to HRT and SRS. Most of it is generally positive. And then the, the level of positivity is reflective in their environment afterwards. Like if they've got a very positive environment afterwards, they have even better results. If their environment afterwards is really shitty, then they can have shitty results and maybe sometimes worse depending. So basically, the outcome of when they receive treatment is determined based on the outcome, uh, based on the environment they go into. Essentially, is what you're saying. Um, that 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 can That'd have a big accurate. that can have a big result afterwards. Yeah, of, of how successful it is. And I know I know exactly which one uh, the study you're talking about. I, that's one of the ones I've I've seen. There's also another one which looked at the quality of life of uh, transgender individuals post operation, and. I believe it was a meta meta analysis of about around 13 studies. I think I have it pulled up here, and it's basically saying that re the results of these studies that when they looked at all these, uh, of all of them, is that they don't, they should really be kind of interpreted with caution just because the low amount of uh, individuals in each uh, study essentially. So we don't we don't basically have a, a good sufficient sample size, and a lot of these studies that look at the tr uh, treatment outcomes, or uh, as in this one in particular. Uh, what was I saying? I just lost my train. Um, yeah, I mean, like th there are very low sample sizes for a lot of these studies because we just don't have a lot of trans people. I mean, that's a thing. Also, a, a lot of these surgeries um, and a lot of these hormone replacement therapies are like continually continuing to develop and continuing to evolve. I mean, if the if the literature suggests later on that SRS or HRT can be avoided or are not preferential to some other form of, of therapy or treatment, then yeah, I mean, I would abandon these. But as it stands right now, I'm pretty sure these are still the APA recommendations on this. One other topic I wanted to get into was just slightly. It was uh, about puberty blockers and the effect on effect it has on children. Because a lot of times, a lot of children, the the kind of what's being debated in the medical community is that whether they should actually, you know, give children who are diagnosed with gender dysphoria puberty blockers. Mm -hmm. Even though that there is a, a lot of studies indicate that most of the children that are diagnosed with gender dysphoria at a young age or relative young age uh, desist after puberty yep or they either desist into heterosexual and uh, heter uh, heterosexual homosexuals or like lesbian bi etc okay and a lot of a lot of there are some studies indicating that they want to kind of uh make it a stand they want to lower the age i believe where we can give them puberty blockers i wanted to hear your opinion on that um i've uh, this is always a massive bait um i've never seen this in my entire life the idea of four or five year olds taking puberty blockers um oh, I, of course of course not i've never heard that before mainly because puberty doesn't even start until a child hits like 10 or 11. um so i, I know that it's a big meme to say like oh we're giving puberty blockers to four-year-olds or something but i've just yeah that's that's yeah that's not what i'm talking about I, i'm not talking about like you know giving them at that young age that'd be ludicrous Sure. So I, I mean, like what we have to do is we just we have to look at sample sizes and see the outcomes. Like if giving kids puberty blockers at, you know, 10 or 11 or 12 or whatever helps them give a little bit more time to decide, you know, what 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 um, I, I guess if they're a trans person or not, if the outcomes of this tend to be far better than not doing it, then I'd be in favor of it. Um, if the outcomes aren't, then I'm not in favor of it. It just depends on where the literature ends up there. Yeah, I think the whole issue is that we there's not enough studies or basically reports showing the long-term effects of giving someone puberty blockers or really a, a, some hormone treatments. Everybody yeah, but I mean, this is how all of foreseen. all of medicine is like trial and error, right? So, I mean, like, you know, you cautiously follow leading research um, or, or novel research, um, and then you adjust your treatments and therapies as time goes on. Like, I mean, that's all you can really do. I think that's all I wanted to talk about today. Okay. Thank you, Corona. Uh Next question is from uh, Admiral. Uh, what is your stance on social justice? And do you believe in an, in an egalitarian society? Uh, let me repeat this. What is your stance on social justice? And do you believe that an egalitarian society inevitably breeds what, what's arguably an unwanted social contract, uh, racism, sexism, etc.? Wait, I'm sorry. Can you say the first 
part of that question. Can you re can you reread that question? Sure. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, what is your sense of social justice? And do you believe that an egalitarian society inevitably breeds what is arguably uh, an, an unwanted social contract, racism, sexism, et cetera? That I, I feel like the question is leading somewhere, but I don't know where. Does an egalitarian society breed racism and sexism? I mean, ideally, an egalitarian, egalitarian society should be free of those things, right? But I'm guessing the person that asked the question is trying to make an example or point towards something I, I guess i don't really understand like by definition an egalitarian society probably shouldn't have any racism or sexism or anything i mean obviously i'm not aware of any societies where all racism and sexism have been eliminated but um sorry and then yeah. also real quick imagine thinking using hormone blockers pre-puberty isn't life altering where the fuck am i if you think that it is then post a study there's no point in talking about your personal opinion. You are nobody. You don't matter to anybody or anything. Why the fuck would you post like, wow, in my opinion, this is crazy. If you think it's bad, then post a study from somebody that actually fucking matters or somebody that's actually done the research. You're Joe Schmo, no name. Nobody gives a fuck what some dude that's got 17,000 hours and Dota 2 says in a fucking Discord room. If you've got evidence that shows that puberty blockers have bad outcomes on adolescent development, then post it. Don't just say like, I can't believe this. This is common sense. Ha 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 ha. That's the dumbest fucking thing in the world to write with no educational background on the matter. It doesn't make any sense. Sorry. Okay, go. Okay. Next question from uh, Perspective Philosophy. Dr. C. Uh, you're on mute. Go for it. Hello there. Can you hear us okay? Yeah. What's up? Uh, yeah. Hi, man. Uh, pleasure to speak to you. Uh, been wanting to speak to you for a while, actually. Um, I'm actually a vegan, but this question is going to be on moral realism and metaethics. I'm okay. just wondering, just to clarify before, obviously, I ask you the question, what actually is your metaethical stance? Because just earlier, you said that you were a cultural relativist, but I was under the opinion that you were a descriptive egoist. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, wait, can't, can't you, I mean, you can still believe in some form of relativism while being an egoist, right? No. I suppose you can. I suppose the foundation of egoism versus the foundation of relativism as in cultural relativism would relate to whether you argue that the, the ego was uh, culturally embedded and therefore the expression of the ego was culturally embedded. Would, is that what kind of what you were going for? Yeah, basically the different cultures are going to lead to people having probably different sets of preferences or, or different what they feel are moral beliefs, I would imagine. And the, what would you say was the foundation of value in that? Would it be the cultural value or would it be the value of the individual in the, um, uh, the, in desire? What do you can you explain what you mean by value? So what would you say that we strive towards in terms of action as an individual in let's say uh, like a telos if one exists? What do we strive towards as an individual? Um, I, th I guess things that th th things that please our preferences. That's kind of reductive, I guess. Um, can you can you ask me a little bit more specifically? Or can you, are you yeah, think, yeah, I mean, great that you said preferences, because um, if you're an egoist and you strive towards preferences, can you be wrong against your own preferences? Like, as in, like, for example, would a heroin addict be right in taking heroin if it causes them overall <clears throat> greater suffering? Yeah, I think so. To them, they would be, yeah. Right. And, and so what is right is their preference to take it, not necessarily the outcome of whether they actually um, experience what is good, bad, right, and wrong. So it's the intention, not the not the consequence. What, so when you say what is right, I would say what is right for them. Um, I don't like or do anything with metaethics at all. I don't know if I believe in a, an overall concept of like goodness, like what is good and what is wrong. Um, for, mm. for me, like if I'm speaking from my perspective, I think you can only speak of what's right and wrong as like whether or not you're satisfying some desire on an individual level relative to each and every person. So every single person has their own sets of what they believe is, is right and wrong. And right is always going to be whatever satisfies said person's preference. And wrong is always going to be something that goes contrary to what they prefer would be the way I would look at it. Um, would, you not, would you not think that, let's say, an individual's actions throughout their entire life relate to a narrative of trying to achieve the greatest overall good within their life, as in the life that best satisfies their overall uh, phenomenological experiences? So the greatest amount of good versus the, you know, the, the least amount of bad? Um, I mean, I think they try that. But I don't think that every human is a perfectly logical being capable of making like the best decisions. Um, so, for instance, somebody that's eating a fuck ton of unhealthy, fatty, fried food is satisfying their preferences constantly. Um, they might be able to get an overall greater satisfaction of life if they would have a healthier diet and exercise. But because humans aren't perfect, um, because humans have a lot of problems seeing through like what are the best decisions or whatever, they might make suboptimal choices. But they're not. But they're making those suboptimal choices because they believe that they're satisfying their preferences in the best way possible, or it seems to be the case. If those choices are suboptimal um, against the standard of their own judgment, as in their desire to seek what is good for themselves, are they not committing a moral harm to themselves against their own 
you know, egoistical desires. Um, they can be, although people don't people don't usually recognize that until it's too late. Um, somebody digging into like an amazing double triple cheeseburger with all these sauces and whatever doesn't feel like they're committing a wrong then. But you hear people oftentimes when they're in the hospital, you know, on their second or third heart attack, it's like, fuck, I should have made better choices, blah, blah, blah. At that point would probably agree. Fuck, maybe I was, you know, maybe I fucked up. Maybe I did do wrong things or whatever. Like, it's generally more a regretful thing. But I don't think that's because of any, like, moral, like, reasoning. I think it's just because his people were really bad at making optimal decisions sometimes. See, I would say it was against a moral reason. And I think that the individual valuing their preferences above their interests would be the issue. The fact that they've, you know, judged it against something that isn't the standard of judgment, which is the, their life, rather than uh, the, what they desire in, in an immediate sense. First order versus second order desires, in other words. Um, in which case... Uh, I guess my question would be if people should desire certain, um, you know, interests against their own life, as in a good life that would lead to the greatest amount of overall pleasure. Could we not argue that this is an actual ethical standard, which can, which would at least relate to egoism? And if we were to say that egoism is inherent, that the ego is inherently tied into socio-political relations, as in Hegelian recognition, could we not say that an individual's right and wrong? Uh, is actually related to an overall ethical standard, which would by far, through egoism, uh, relate to robust moral realism and instead altruism rather than personal preferences. I mean, I, I guess it depends on what your definition there is of, of moral realism. Like if I see that certain groups of people act in ways um, that, that are satisfying certain preferences, um, just because we might be able to broadly say that like people are acting in certain ways and, and you know, even throughout like a culture or society that like people tend towards certain ways that benefit themselves or society, just because these are all descriptively true statements, I don't think that's necessarily indicative of some sort of like morality that guides it or some sort of like real moral fact or principle that's actually guiding these things um i i think it's just things that are descriptively true like if i were to like roll a whole bunch of marbles down a hallway and watch them go in certain directions i don't think there needs to be some underlying you know fact that's guiding them towards a certain destination you know they just are moving in a certain way and i can describe where they're going but i don't need like any additional moral truths to make those decisions or descriptions I see where you're saying. Um, I guess my disagreement would simply say that there would be a an ontology in relation to humanity, a functional concept of in terms of McIntyre, in which we could judge whether something was good, bad, right, and wrong. Um, I would love, obviously, to talk about this further. Obviously, time constraints, obviously, mm -hmm. not applicable. Uh, if you would like to discuss it, um, obviously, I'd, I'd love to hit you up and we can uh, have a debate. And hopefully, I can uh, debate you on veganism. I know that you've been avoiding debates on uh, veganism as of late. But uh, it seems to me that the people who've debated you on veganism have only given the argument for marginal cases, at least in a different light. And there's never been a real positive claim for veganism. And as a Hegelian vegan, I really don't feel like anyone's done justice in that. So if uh, if you would be interested, I I'd love to debate you on that. Um, yeah, maybe we can talk about it sometime. Can I? Uh, so I'm curious in asking you a question. Um, yeah. If you so this is one of my big problems with moral realism is the idea that moral fact exists um, is, is is two problems one that leads to the other the first is that it feels to me like we don't have a sensory organ that can interpret like moral fact um, so for instance like I, I hope to say that like I can tell you the properties of my phone because I have eyes that collect visual information I've got hands and, and, and touch that collects sensory information like that um, you know I've got a nose I can give you a smell but it seems like we don't have like any way to in inter interpret like moral fact like we don't have a sense organ for that which leads to my second my, my, my actual question I guess is if you have two people that disagree about a fact of the matter if it comes to like um, you know, like physics or biology, like physical objects, like things that exist in the world, usually we can resolve these disputes using sense data. So like if somebody says, well, that's red, and someone else says, well, that's blue, um, we can get people to look at it, we can measure the wavelength of light reflected from it, and we can actually settle a disagreement. How do you settle disagreements between two people that have a disagreement of moral fact? And I don't mean something like, is child rape wrong? I mean like, should gay people be allowed to be married? Like something more ambiguous like that. How do you settle those disagreements of moral fact um yeah obviously that's a great question and i think that like when we look at these things i think that a lot of these disagreements um there's there's fundamental problems with rationality so the first issue would be whether people are raised in um you know let's say if you're liberal versus libertarian there is this issue that two rationalities when even when someone applies logic consistently mm -hmm. can come to two very different conclusions yeah um, and i think that that alone shows the the difficulty of, of determining right and wrong mm -hmm. um 
And I think that the, another another aspect of that is even if we did agree on a rationality, um, how do we, you know, what what by what metric do we use to determine what is right and wrong? Mm -hmm. And I would say that um, a Hegelian approach in the sense that it is the expression of subjectivity and in relation to the greatest all, overall experiences of an individual's life, um, simpliciter. So what we would say is that we are all individuals in uh, cooperating. We begin our cooperation at least in a most minimal sense through selfish interest in our inherent nature, which is to seek the greatest good for mm -hmm. ourselves, which we cannot deny. And in that, I think that we have to accept that the person that creates the overall greatest argument, which increases pleasure and minimizes pain in relation to those individuals, by that I mean the greatest expression of will, mm -hmm. uh, is the one that is most correct. So in that case, it... it um, or, or maybe, maybe, maybe I should have asked a more fundamental question in terms of like when you say moral realism, what does that mean to you? Um, when I, yeah, when I think of moral realism, I think that what that means is that there there is some moral fact of the matter. There is like independent like of all human thought and cognition, there are like moral truths. So like murder is wrong. Like that would be like that's just a fact that is a fact of the world. Um, but it feels like what you've described there. I don't think you said anything that I would necessarily disagree with for how like a society could come to a conclusion about what is morally right or morally wrong but i don't understand how any of those conclusions require moral fact can you explain that? well i would say that the, the idea of the idea of moral fact is is in relation to the, the like when i when i say the greatest expression of mm -hmm. objectivity it it it's not to say that like um it's the fact that what we are doing is observing individuals ontologically as in that subjects or an ontological existence for each other and that when i create a, i cannot just simply assume a system or uh, be given a system which is inherently correct mm -hmm. what makes it correct is the foundational concepts which is the fact that each society has created an ethical system based on the greatest expression of um even an individuals uh, even like let's say it was a tyrannical system uh you know any uh, a master slave morality where a guy try to you know create the greatest overall life for himself i would say that that would rationally lead to the conclusion that he needs to cooperate with others in such a way that he would in overall um instantiate the greatest good uh epistemically in a language as in like what is good and investigate what is good right mm -hmm. and wrong uh because he'd be incapable of understanding it uh, himself or even incapable of creating a community that um only ser searched for his own personal goods because that would again lead to a epistemic bias and and i suppose the ontology of this would simply be the greatest expression of subjectivity um rather than in, in a robust sense like so i guess the difference is in in a minimal sense you could say that it would simply be you know the um the expression of an individual's desires when i would say that someone could be wrong in expressing their own desires they could be wrong against their their, their in against their own preferences they, they could prefer to take heroin but they're actually wrong against that okay. their nature in in that respect shows that they are they, they should be seeking something else and they sure. should reject the heroin and, and go for something else. well can, okay i'm so sorry okay can i i just want to ask one more question and then we'll move on sorry i don't want to like absolutely yeah. so like okay so like here's a question okay so when we talk about what like what like what is right or what is wrong so let's say that you mm -hmm. have a society full of people that um give you access to a drug when you turn 20 um, or, or I'm sorry, let's say they give you access to a drug when you turn 40 and you do this drug for about two years Nathan, and then you always die at age 42. Okay. So it is, but, but from 40 to 42, you are reaching highs that are just incomparable with normal human experience. It is unbelievably, unfathomably amazing. And then let's say that you have another society, um, where, these people live long and healthy lives, um, and then they go to you know age seventy or eighty. It, it feels like we're trying to compare like incommensurate values. Like, how do you compare the high you could get from forty to forty-two with living a long and healthy life? How do you say that one is better than the other, or one meets the subjective preferences you know superiorly or in a superior manner from one society to the next? How can you ever make that judgment? Oh, I think that's I think that's a brilliant point. Actually, I think that the, the, the I think the, there is a definite issue, especially with the idea of like like one one thing you said is like mm -hmm. this you know almost um ineffable uh quality towards pain and pleasure like yeah. as if someone is experiencing a high that is almost indescribable how could i even tell you that what this feels like and whether it's worth it or not just as much as um you know the the person who lives the longer life um they mightn't be able to describe the the what what they feel i guess the point of what i'd say is that it's not simply about pain and pleasure in the sense that it's not about um innate feelings of um highs and lows it's about um the mitigation of let's say harm and the overall um creation of uh of of, of the expression of po possibility in this respect so if i try and seek a certain goal 
to the, the which is the good um it it's inherently broke into smaller values in my life and the greatest expression of those values and contentment with those outcomes mm -hmm. is overall what i'm looking for so i would be looking for a state of eudaimonia and flourishing rather than you know a state of um of highs and lows i'd be looking for a state in which the individual has a pain pleasure ratio in which we can say that you know this is um actually worth taking uh, i do think there isn't there is an aspect of that which is difficult to comprehend whether that's someone you know someone may prefer um, a pain pleasure ratio which is different mm -hmm. and all we can do is create a a standard based off our understanding of human nature and all i would say is that what we need to do is investigate humanity more investigate individuals more and create more well-developed and well-defined concepts in order to understand human experience so that we can define whether this well understand whether this would actually be a risk worth undertaking okay okay cool i appreciate the answer cool okay um seeing as we're on the uh philosophy topic um ask yourself this here uh, where are you? He's off the top. Over there. Yeah, there he is. Okay. Gotcha. Go for it. Hey, what's what up, buddy? Destiny? Not much, man. Uh, just really quick question. Do you have any idea whatsoever how perspective sophistry gave an answer to your question about resolving values when two people have different values, how to determine who's correct as a fact of the matter? Um, so it's an answer that I've heard given by, I think, conscience before, which it, it, it makes it sound like if you, d if, if you had perfectly rational logic, I, if he's typing in chat, you can correct me if I give you a bad summary of what you're saying, but like, <laughs> if you had like a collection of like perfectly rational people that were capable of analyzing every single variable of, of human existence in society, that there is going to be some, there's going to be some picture of this is like the peak of like human flourishing, um, with respect to every single individual. And that this is a peak that we can kind of like intuitively move towards. That's, that's kind of what he, f it feels like he was basically saying, um, that every society that so like so for easy ones let's say you have a society where there's child rape is allowed and another one where there's no child rape that if you were to do a wide analysis of that society in one society everybody's growing up you know being hateful of everybody because they're getting raped all the time it's fucking horrible and the other one people are happier that's a better society and then you would just go on and you kind of compare values you know over and over and over again and you'd eventually wind up with some society that has reached like the peak of like moral good basically um and then even for smaller issues like gay marriage maybe in some society the gay people are happier and the other society the gay people are miserable so you'd pick and choose Society is like that. That's kind of what it sounded like he was getting at, basically. So, are we saying that it's necessarily the case that there is always between two choices, one choice which will maximize more people's preferences? Well, so that's what it sounded like he was saying. But then my question Eminem is, is it feels rapper. like there up, are things. It feels like that there are. It feels like that there are incommensurate things here that can't be, com by definition, can't be compared. So for instance, let's say in one society you allow gay marriage and in the other society gay marriage is banned. In the gay marriage society, gay people are happy because they're getting married. All the religious people are upset because they feel like that's an, like an obstruction of, of human like dignity or whatever. How do you measure their discomfort with the gay people's happiness, especially when they outweigh the number of gay people? How do you possibly like draw up a comparison there? And I don't know how you can ever do that, which is my problem. So yeah, so that's an interesting thing, but you'd probably agree that's an epistemic problem, right? That's not, that's not, um, like you're saying that there's a difficulty in assessing um, people's preferences in that situation, right? Yeah, that it seems like you can't make a statement about the fact of the matter relating to like what is good or bad of either of those, which is my whole problem do, with kind of realistic argument or realist arguments here. Don't you, don't you think there might be, or in fact is <laughs> like a more fundamental problem than just epistemology there? which is that he's saying that it's necessarily the case that, you know, if you have what one person's got a preference for P, one person has a preference against P, that one of those, uh, if followed, maximizes, you know, preferences for all agents or whatever. He's saying that's necessarily the case, but he hasn't demonstrated that the contrary entails a contradiction, has he? What, can you explain what you mean by that? He hasn't demonstrated that there's a contradiction? Well, that if, people... if, if you're saying something has to be the case, I take that to mean that you'd have a contradiction if it weren't the case. It's logically impossible for it to be otherwise. Uh, I mean, if you want to ask us a question, apparently I've been unmuted. Oh, yeah, go for it. Hit him up. Oh, it'll just turn into me wrecking perspective philosophy. Do you really want to do that? I mean, That'll take over your whole AMA. I don't want to derail the whole fucking AMA.
So, so we've got Destiny for another 30 minutes because uh, Final Fantasy VII came out. What, is, so what, what, is, so what, what does Destiny want? Destiny. I don't, I don't, I don't want to derail his aim. Um, well, real, real quick, I guess. Um, I would, I guess I'll just hear. Um, I can stay for an extra 20 minutes. So okay, I just want to hear a, a quick. I guess like, um, what would your response be to that perspective philosophy? Go for it. Um, if, if you could let's, just... before he responds, let's be clear about what the criticism is. If yeah. you're saying that anytime two people have a disagreement of preferences, one person prefers P, one person prefers not P, that one or the other preference is actually the one that will maximize preferences generally for everybody, if followed, right? Then you have to actually be able to derive a contradiction on the contrary, right? Can you do that, PP? Well, I think what you've described there Straight, is that like, you would have to choose. Straightforward answer. Yeah. Well, yes or no, choose, please. Choose. Wait, let him, well, answer. Well, here, let him, let him go. Go for it. What? Yeah, yeah he'll, he'll go off. You'll see. He won't answer. Um, so if I understand correctly, um, the idea is that you would have to choose between two people's preferences. I think my point is, is that if someone is asserting their preference without considering another agent, they have already committed an epistemic flaw. Um, the, the point of what I'd make is that the, the way in which we divest the world metaphysically is through language. And that language is a um, cooperative venture in which relies upon the recognition of another, which is able to <laughs> um, understand, uh, able to... Um, give verification as to whether an object is or is not the way it is as if an action will or will not where was the a... answer there pp um i'm, I'm, I'm still waiting for that yes or no um well, smells like not, freedom in here from philosophy but i don't think normally people write yes and then write well yeah it would be great no to know what the answer is right uh, can you derive a contradiction on the contrary yes or no the, the point of what i'm what saying happens is with pp if, if you wreck him by pushing him into a corner he'll just weasel like this forever he won't answer you, me. you say i'm weaseling but yeah you're well, over talking us and you're not allowing us to explain why don't you position. answer the question i think that it's that you don't have a why very don't good grasp of philosophy oh ask yeah, stop being an elegant elaborate. ass and let him finish his question uh, why don't okay. why don't you why don't you let him answer, finish his answer and then elaborate yeah. Yeah, come okay so, right. I'm, I'm, guys, I'm only i'm only going to listen to doobie or destiny right now what is what can he actually derive a contradiction though or is he just going to ramble well wait so I'm curious. So, so pers want... perspective philosophy. Do you think you should have to derive a contradiction to, to prove the argument correct, or do you think it's not relevant to the argument? Or like, it's not to what, prove the what, what argument I was trying correct. To it's to show that it's impossible. I was trying to understand. Um, obviously, ask yourself criticism there. Like his question really more than anything. Well, that that was kind of me position. I was trying to explain what I understood of what he said, so that he could tell us if I've understood it correctly or not. So then I was trying to say that if if I've understood it correctly, you'd have to, if you're saying that I have to choose between you know um, preference A and preference B, that that that's already the mistake. That that the, you're trying to assert that there is we choose between one or two preferences in relation to each other's egos, when ego itself is actually a cooperatively constructed concept through recognition and and language. That my ability to understand the world is something that is dependent upon a, a, an ethical relationship and that what you're trying to assert is something closer to perhaps a social contract theory of justice rather than um you know a, a hegelian understanding of justice which understands that justice itself is embedded in freedom and language and reason itself and that if you are essentially asserting one preference over another you are being inherently irrational if you are not considering the other agent <sighs> And where was the answer to my question there? Okay, wait, can I, I understand, I'm, ask yourself, can I understand your question more? I don't understand what you mean. Can you explain what you mean by demonstrate a contradiction? Okay. So if we say that it's impossible, mm -hmm. that means that the situation entails a contradiction. That's what logical impossibility is. Physical impossibility is where the contradiction is with a law of physics. Are okay. you with me on that? Yeah. Okay, so if he says it's necessarily the case that if one agent prefers P and the other uh, agent prefers not P, that someone's preference there, if followed, maximizes preferences generally for all actors, right? Mm -hmm. It can't be the case that that uh, that that's not the case, right? He has to actually show that the contrary entails a contradiction. So wouldn't the contrary, if it, wouldn't the contrary be one person that prefers a world that doesn't maximize the well-being? So if one person prefers a world where every tenth person is randomly murdered, wouldn't that be a sufficient demonstration of that, or no? Sorry, I don't understand. Uh, I don't understand your example there. So, if somebody, uh, what, what, what are we looking like, for the contradiction in? Could you give me an example answer to like what would? Well, I don't. I don't know how he would derive a contradiction there. Well, what would be like so an example? Like, like what would be a way he could derive a contradiction? I guess I'm trying. When you like, what are you looking for oh, a contradiction? I don't see a way to. That's the problem. Well, what what are you looking for a contradiction in? I'm looking for him to show. That uh, so when he says that if you have two agents mm -hmm. and they have different preferences, right? Mm -hmm. One prefers P, one prefers not P. Mm -hmm. 
that uh, there's always going to be, it's always going to be the case that one person's preference, P or not P, maximize, if followed, mm-hmm. is going to maximize preferences generally for all actors, right? Okay. So there's a case, uh, so the idea is the case where uh, neither person's preference maximizes preferences for all actors, right? It's like maybe they both equally maximize preferences for all actors or something. He has to actually show that that situation, right? The situation where it's not the case that uh, one or the other agent's uh, actions maximize preferences for all actors entails a contradiction if he wants to say it's impossible. I'm, mm-hmm. I might just be philosophically retarded, but I, I don't understand at all, I guess. I don't understand, like, what he has to demonstrate. If, if I could, if I could maybe well, give if, maybe if, some, if, some more... Um, well, here, let's, let's, let's just... Let's you want, I, I kind of I think that if you want to understand it, just go from square one like this, okay? So, perspective philosophy. Are you a relativist about morality? I, I, I am... Go ahead. Oh, sorry, uh, it's for him. Yeah, okay. go. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not a relativist, although I do believe that okay. our epistemic... Let me ask a question norms, or two. Let, uh, let yeah. me ask a question or two. Okay, so... Let's say that I, pr- uh, th- let's say that um, on my, okay, well, also the other question to ask is, Boy. well, I don't know if I want to get into what is goodness, but let's say that one person thinks it's good to rape a kid. One person thinks it's bad to rape a kid, right? How do you go about saying that someone has to be correct there? One person is correct and the other person is wrong. Um, okay. Um, I guess so. Like what is goodness is the best actually way to get into that. Uh, and the overall thing I would say is that every individual inherently feels desire, and that is the the grounding of, of all ethics and that desire itself, and the fact that someone has a preference in the first place, a you know a a, a will that they try and in, and exact upon the world, is the grounding, and that they do that in relation to trying to create a certain circumstance in relation to their phenomenological experiences. They try and create a world which they feel pleasure. They try and create a world in which they feel good, that they don't feel um, a negative phenomenological experience and I, I'm, I would like to point out that positive and negative phenomenological experiences are inherent to being I don't think that they can be denied they are the qualia and the grounding of, of all we feel uh, you'd have to deny subjectivity itself to deny those things so okay so uh, when one agent so, prefers p and one agent prefers not p say p is like about raping a kid or something you want to yeah. say that one of them is right and the other is wrong yes Right. So oh, yes. why why is that the case? Why is it the case that um, what, how, how do we how do we determine that? People? Wait, can I take a stab at this? Hold on. Let me so I can see if I can understand both. both sides here. So let's say that one prefers P, one prefers not P. Let's say that P is providing food for everybody. Let's say that not P is starving everybody, not providing any food for anybody. Mm-hmm. Couldn't we argue that P here satisfies like the innate desires of most people and not P doesn't? Therefore, we can say that P is correct or no. Well, all we'd be making there is a descriptive statement about how many preferences are satisfied, right? It's not clear to me how you've uh, gotten out of relativism by making a descriptive statement that any brand of anti-realist, error theorist, uh, non-cognitivist, whatever, can agree with. All of the anti-realist positions can agree that there's a fact of the matter about which view there will maximize more people's preferences. I don't see how you've gotten out of relativism. Just oh, I, can, I, I, understand what you're saying. I, I understand what you're saying. So you're asking is essentially why we should care about, you know, anything but our own preferences. No, yeah. no, no. I'm ask I'm asking how you say that one person is right and the other person is wrong. Yeah, well well first I would say that like when we come to epistemics, we can agree that what we're like if we understand truth to be instrumental and that what we're doing is trying to seek our own ends and so you know, and our epistemics and knowledge to, you know, try and maximize. Uh, let's that. make this simple. PP, what's it mean? Oh my God. To be right morally. What does I'm, it mean I'm, to be right morally? It means to be epistemically correct against the greatest expression of will, which we inherently seek. Fuck does that mean? It means that you, you it means that, okay. It means that you as an individual have a will. I mean, the desire. That, okay. I have a uh, will. Yes. Okay. Yes. And that will, it relates to trying to create a world which maximizes your, you know, pleasure and pain at least in at least at a fundamental level that's undeniable wait wait wait, wait. what do we mean pleasure and pain Max, are you just as in you want to minimize your pain and maximize the like as in minimize your negative phenomenological experiences and maximize your uh is, you know, is negative phenomenological experience just defined as the kind of experience i don't want to maximize it's well, that's something that you would to you be would fair. Inherit. Well, and also to be fair, qualia by definition isn't going to have a great definition, right? Like your preference for a certain thing, like you can't really explain that. Like you can't really explain a qualia, right? It, so, it, Destiny, with surely we both right now, what we're hearing is we all have preferences. So I agree, mm-hmm. we have preferences. 
Mm -hmm. you so have a how, you have what do you, what does, okay. So we're trying to mm -hmm. understand what it means to say something is right or wrong. People. Okay. So, so it's and actually, after that, we're so, going to try to understand so, how so we're trying to like maybe educate you right or wrong in a situation. Wait, okay, hold on. Let oh, me, yeah. let, wait, can I, let me take a stab at that perspective. You can tell me if you disagree then, and then why I can respond. Yeah, it's, it, yeah. Okay. So it feels like what perspective is saying is that if we could create an infinite number of, of moral codes, that one of these moral codes when applied to society is going to create a maximal amount of human flourishing between every person. And that 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 particular moral code is going to be like the closest we can get to like what is moral truth or what is like a morally true like statement like that whatever maximizes like the preferences of, of most people involved basically i would say interest about preferences um simply because i think that individuals can be wrong in their preferences so like you could want heroin but then that not actually be good for you i'd say <laughs> what is actually good for you in the relation to what produces the positive phenomenological experiences and reduces the negative phenomenological experiences so we're saying that there is a fact okay so all it means for something to be good is that it maximizes someone's or it maximizes what everyone's the aggregate uh interest or the individual's interest I would say that um, the individual finds themselves in, in the, the collective in that much, in the, in the universal, but that it is the aggregate in that sense. And I think that we'll, we'll seek the aggregate okay. primarily for all, so, at least, on the, at least uh, so, for the fundamentally our so own interest. Good, goodness is a synonym for that which maximizes aggregate preferences or interests, if you want to use that word. Uh, it maximizes the, yeah, the expression of wealth for the greatest amount of people, yeah. Okay, so when you're saying there's a fact of the matter about who's right and wrong, all you're making is a descriptive claim that there's a fact of the matter about which view maximizes the most people's preferences. I don't uh, see how no, you've gotten out of relevance. No, I'm, saying, I'm, I'm saying there's an epistemic claim that an individual cannot seek their own interests without relying upon the collaborative, in, the collaborative interests of try, another. Try to, try to track the discussion. Remember, the uh, initial I, question, I, the, I initial, no, the initial <laughs> question that we're starting from uh, is well, if, I may, if, I may, if I may, if I may, if I may, one person is right to and another it. person is wrong, if one person prefers P and another person prefers not P. Now, if you've I, defined goodness as the thing that, as that which maximizes the preferences of the most agents, right? So then all we get to there is that there's gonna be a fact of the matter about what the, what uh, proposition P or not P is going to maximize the preferences of the most agents. That's just some kind of descriptive claim. I don't see how you've gotten out of relativism. Well, if, if I may- Do you follow destiny, that, Destiny? If, if I may talk to Destiny um, for listen, a second. I just wanna know what, he's, what he thinks of what was just said there. Um, well, I, 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 it feels like if, if there is an absolutely true claim about what maximizes human flourishing, then that wouldn't be re relativism. That would be objective moral fact. It feels like, but wait, 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 but the thing that it's a fact about is just what maximizes the most people's preferences. Yeah. But whatever maximizes most people's preferences would be the good. That would be the moral fact. Wait, why do I have to agree with that notion of the good? That's just some like, kind of like in... descriptive claim. As in, like, why couldn't you, for example, assert one claim over the other? Because you'd be commit, you'd be breaking Hume's law, wouldn't you? I don't. Uh, wait a second. I don't know. I don't even know what you're talking about there. So, uh, like, when, so wait, 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 wait. I don't. I don't want the critique. I don't want the critique to slide away. Right? Slippery perspective philosophy. When you say, say that, when you when you say that the good, the good, right? That that's just a synonym for whatever maximizes the most agents' preferences. When you say there's a fact of the matter about what's good, all you're making is a descriptive claim that anyone, right, an error theorist, non-cognitivist, whatever, subjectivist, can agree with, right? Yeah, sure, there's a fact of the matter about what maximizes people's preferences. Well, if you're saying that I'm making a descriptive claim when I say that there is a scenario which, if described, would create the greatest overall benefit for the most people, and that would be a, a moral fact, then absolutely that I'm, I'm describing a moral fact there. Uh, and that, 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 that is a reality no, no, which I would argue would be better. But what I'm sounds, actually doing if, well, if, wait, if, by if better, listen, by, that's a tautology by better, by better, but, all you're saying, well, no, it's not, it's not a tautology because you haven't let us explain. Okay, wait, okay, wait. So, hey, yeah. Okay. So it feels like, it feels like the disagreement it feels like it's like a meta ethical one. Like, how do you define what is goodness? Oh, yeah. I guess. Yeah. So, if I would say that, like, goodness is, and I think that we cannot deny our, our own interest in trying to achieve at least a positive phenomenological interest. I don't mm -hmm. know. Would you disagree with that? Or, um, I would agree with you. But so, like, um, so the, I'm going to draw a distinction here between humans and viruses. Okay. So, for mm -hmm. a virus to maximize its existence, it typically needs to hijack and insert itself into another cell to produce more of itself. Would you say that when a virus enters a cell, that the virus is like committing like that's good to the cell? That's that's maximizing like no, virus I, like I human would, flourishing. Because I, wouldn't, I would say sure. I would so then, if you wouldn't, then I would ask like, well, then what are humans satisfying their preferences? How is that indicative of any underlying moral fact? How is that not just like a descriptive statement about what humans do? Kind of. 
of like what viruses do? What's the difference there? Oh. I would say that what human, I mean, I mean, obviously I'm describing what humans are. And if I say, if I'm making a descriptive statement about what humans do and are, I would say that essentially what I'm saying is that humans are a concept that what we are is actually, um, is, is a verb. Uh, it is an understanding of that. We behave, how we behave throughout time. It's not a single, um, instance of, um, behavior. Like we, we seek to achieve, we desire, um, in general, we try to create positive phenomenological experience. It's something that's undeniable and in our nature. And I would say that's inherently true of all humanity and inherently true of all uh, subjects and sentient beings. Yeah, I understand that. I'm just, I guess it feels like your disagreement for you guys is what you define as being good. Because it sounds like what Ask Yourself's argument is, is that your definition of good is essentially tautological. You're saying that good things are good, basically. And he's saying, well, that's not like, that isn't indicative of moral fact. That's like not moral uh, I, objectivity. It's just like a whatever statement. And then, but you seem to think that like, saying that like, well, good things are what people prefer. That almost seems like tautological in and of itself, no? Well, if we want I, to be guess, really clear, they're... Destiny, Sorry. one second, I'm going to reply to that. If you want to be really clear, I just I just don't understand who's wrong, how he's saying that someone is wrong in the situation where you have an agent who uh, desires P and an agent who desires not P, right? If he's just saying there's a fact of the matter about whether P or not P will maximize preferences, that's something that anyone with any meta ethic can agree with. Right. What okay, what if, is if, what if is I'm one made. agent? What is one agent wrong about there, PP? Who who what's They're wrong about wrong against about? the wrong interests and in, in the foundational level? I think that the idea that like we and I behave in Wait, a certain what? way, which is so if I behave in a certain way, which is towards my preference, but it doesn't consider another individual, then I am committing an epistemic flaw because what I'm saying is that I'm rejecting the knowledge of what is actually good for me and not. What I would say is that knowledge of what is good for me, which I inherently seek, is only possible to only possibly achieved through cooperation because that is how epistemics work you can't you can't verify and falsify claims based upon a single individual because of individual bias and the problems of individual reasons rambling you're just rambling okay, at okay well, listen then, i think like, we should we'll set this up sometime and yeah. i'll hear you guys hash it or whatever so i'm kind of curious but i don't i'm yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry yeah, I'm, so I'll, much I'll, 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 I'll get off I'll, all i'll leave you with is that all pp has said here is that there's a fact of the matter about what maximizes preferences everyone can agree with that every brand of anti-realist can agree with that i don't understand how he's shown that someone is and, wrong and, in virtue of their preferences and if i may just off the street and if i may i'll basically say that uh, an individual who is inherently at the very minimal an egoist is forced into altruism because of the inherent nature of cooperation, which, which allows us to metaphysically divest the world. Yeah, uh, and as an, as an egoist, I agree with the first part that you are forced into a form of altruism if you have to, if you're like logically sound, you, you have to, right? No, oh, well, that's great. And uh, hopefully we can discuss this further. Sure. And uh, even thank you to ask yourself for asking... Some oh yeah, and and, and of course, of course, if you if you want to, you know, get destroyed anytime, just come by the server. I'm always happy to body you, PP. Um, I don't want to get muted again, and you know, over to I, I, I know, I know you're scared. I, I know it's okay. Uh, uh, thank I you know. very much, uh, Destiny, for tolerating sure us. Thank thing. you. Thanks for the conversation, yeah. guys. For the record, I told Doobie that I wanted them to chat, so don't blame Doobie on that one. Okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. Keep going. Go, go for it. Yeah, What's back for the question? Okay. okay. Um. Okay. Uh, moving on. Um. Where were we? Uh, let's just let's just go with this. Um, Doughboy, um, what's your opinion on the idea of a social credit system, government surveillance methods, and the general advocacy of strict obedience to authority? Um, there are three different questions there. The last one, strict obedience to authority. Fuck that shit. If authority doesn't make sense, I mean, um, I know there's a fucking Martin Luther King quote in here. It's something like an unjust law or like a wrong law is an unjust law or something, or we have an obligation to protest unjust laws. Um, I, I mean, like, if, if there's, like, a law or a rule or some authority figure that's bullshit, then fuck it. I mean, you have an obligation to resist. Fuck that shit. Um, so that's just the third part. Um, what was the first and second part of that again? Sorry. Um, basically, your, your uh, um, thoughts on, like, a social credit system like China. Oh, um, I, I mean, like, social credit is an interesting concept, I do think in limited forums, I think you could actually implement this in a really effective manner. Um, I So I, um, okay, I don't know how much of this is true. I think it might be true that given some piece of information, I think you can verify if you voted or not in a given state. 
I think that's true in the United States. So if you have like your social security number or like your address and your name, you can look up and see if you voted. Now it doesn't tell you who you voted before, but you can see if you voted. Um, I heard the idea floated in 2016, I think, that it would be cool if Facebook gave you the opportunity to verify if you'd voted or not. And that would have very interesting implications for people, say, on Facebook that debate politics. Well, did you vote? Because if you start finding out that there are huge swaths of people that seem to be very invested in political outcomes that don't actually vote, maybe it would actually pressure some of those people into actually going out and voting. Maybe there are forms of social credit like that that could be positive. I don't know if we'd consider this social credit. Or like in Japan, I think if you're obese in Japan, I think they, they measure you like around the waistline. And if you're too fat, you, you I think you have to pay more for insurance or you get doctor. I don't know. There was like, I heard, I'd heard something about this a while ago. Um, maybe there are forms of social pressures or social credit that we can use to push people in positive directions. We already do this to some extent with social pressure. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not like, I'm not super against the concept. Um, you would just obviously have to be super careful how you implement it, right? Like if we go full off into one direction where you get like woke points for like how many times did you like use the correct pronouns in a day or something and now you get like 50 woke bucks that you can go and spend at your local like hair dye shop. Or obviously this is fucking stupid. I wouldn't be in favor of that. Um, but like in, in terms of like some sort of social credit, I, I don't know. It seems like it could be really prone to abuse. That would be like really fun to think about. That, that, that's how I would answer that, yeah. Cool. Okay, next question from Thottom and Empire. Mm-hmm. Um, would you ever do another video or live stream of you doing shrooms? Um, maybe. I've always wanted to, but usually the people that I'm with don't really want to live stream it. I think it would be interesting too, though. But one of the problems, though, is that with psychedelics, like that's very much like stuff that occurs in the mind. I don't know how interesting it would be to just watch a person like, uh, dude, is it real? Uh, like, I don't know if it would be like fun to watch from the outside. Like, you don't really have any fucking idea, like the uh, explosions that are going on behind the eyelids of somebody that's taking like a really high dose of psychedelics. Like, you don't really get it at all. So I don't know, maybe something. Okay. Uh, next question is from uh, Esoteric Paternalism. Um, what is your opinion on nation states that have a state religion such as Saudi Arabia? What are your opinions on nation states that have a s state relation? Uh, religion. Oh, like, uh, yeah, fuck state religion. I don't like that shit at all. But I mean, like, I'm a huge liberal and I'm American. So, yeah, I, maybe if I was born in a different society, maybe I would. But I don't want fucking state religion. Fuck that shit. Fuck theology. Cool. Okay. Um, hot nine, hot, hot ninety one is in here. Um, says he debated you a year ago. Uh, let's see, hot, you're unmuted. No, he's he's not here. Is he dead? Nope. Mister Mister Hot, let me know when oh, you're. Oh, uh, hey, available. sorry, hey, is it my turn? Me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, wait, I can hear you. Go for it. Hey, what's up, Destiny? We debated about like the tariffs a year and a half ago. I think we debated twice or something. Yeah, what about it? Yeah, it was twice. Um, well, I actually wanted to talk about stock buybacks this time because I've read or I think I watched a video of you debating some dude a couple months back talking about um, you're like, I, I don't know if you're ambivalent towards it or if you're okay with it, but like... Yeah, I'm fine with it. Major corporations doing stock buybacks. I mean, do you see any sort of moral hazard between like major airline industries, especially taking public money and then using some of that money to buy their own stock back again and again and again? Um, if you're taking public money and you're just buying back stock with it, it's probably not a good I idea. I mean, it happens years later, so there's some, like, you know, time between when they <clears> Well, it depends on what kind of public money you're talking about. If you've got to take out a short-term loan because there's zero equity in the market or because you're going through, like, some catastrophic failure of business, like 96% of air traffic dropping because of, like, COVID-19, um, I think it's probably okay to provide, like, loans for those businesses to be paid back later. In times of great crisis, that's fine. Government can step in there. It's a good role of government, I think. Um... Okay, so that, that works for like maybe small business, but you don't think there's any like moral hazard between public companies from, yeah, I mean, especially major companies that we would consider public, taking additional public money. And then later on, the, those same companies taking the cash they should have saved for a black swan event like this and buying shares back on behalf of their shareholders. You don't Absolutely think a not. I don't think companies should be in the business of saving for black swan events. That sounds catastrophic to an economy. The last thing that I would want as an investor is to be pouring money into a company that's just hoarding cash, that's just sitting on massive somebody cash let, reserves. Somebody should let Apple know. Somebody should let Apple know. Doesn't Apple money. literally pay dividends to their shareholders? Yeah, but they also have enough cash reserves to hold them over during an event like this where they don't have to take public money. <laughs> like, so do you think it, Apple? It, do you think Apple and their profit margins is comparable to the profit margins of every single major airline in the United States that's had a history of bankruptcies and operating on razor thin profit margins that are hyper? You're making a great argument for us nationalizing the airline industry. 
I never said I. Well, for, firstly, I, I never said I was opposed to nationalizing the airline industry. I don't know if it would work out that well. Oh, okay. Well, okay. I, I, I never imply that you did, but I'm just saying that it's. it's oh a good sure, argument. yeah. I mean, maybe. I mean, like the fact that these things seem to be like so. For instance, like healthcare doesn't seem to work well, like in a in a profit driven market system. Like it might be the case right. that like you just can't make money there and provide good service. Um, that might be the case with airlines. Like airlines are very fucking hard to maintain in, in a profitable measure. Their margins are razor thin. They lose money lots of years, even on their high years. They don't right. always make up for that. They go bankrupt all the time. Yeah, maybe maybe yeah. it is the case that having some sort of nationalized. I think every European country has at least like one nationalized airline service um maybe it is the case that that would be like a better way to run them that's possible sure like an okay. airline I mean, public option okay but but i think that we could probably have a, an intelligent debate about stock buybacks like aside from this but it just seems to me to be like a real huge problem where you know there's a specific industry that's famous for purchasing back their own stock and they're going to be the beneficiary of a huge portion of not i'm not talking about like the, the forgivable loans if you keep payroll I'm talking about like literally being bailed out with, with additional money that has no strings attached. When do, does this? The, I mean, like yeah, part it, of the bailout package was a separate from the the I think it was 350 billion that was put aside for businesses in general that maintain payroll, um, um, or individual industries being supplemented with cash. Sure, I mean, I'd have to I'd have to look into this more specifically. But like, what's your issue? Do you want to get rid of dividends too? No, I don't mind dividends. I think artificially inflating the inflating the market price of the stock is a problem. No. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think. About and, and, and I know we're, 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 if we're you're if you're paying it. if you're paying dividends on a stock, that stock is more attractive towards towards investors, right? So the stock price is going to be higher. Yeah, but, but it's issued on a quarterly basis, so it's not. It's different than like declaring a one-time stock buyback, where you know, in a lot of cases, the investors aren't kept aware like ahead of time. Well, first of all, stock buybacks aren't just no done. Buyback. Well, first of all, stock Sorry. buybacks aren't done just one time. And also, don't you have to announce a stock buyback in advance? Like, isn't that something that Wait, the board? Well, the first, the first point. What do you mean by stock buybacks aren't done one time? What do you mean? By like, that? you can do, you can continually do stock buybacks as a company. Like, you, they might not be scheduled like yeah, quarterly. Yeah, but they're not like a quarterly thing that goes on quarterly. Like, you know what I mean? Like, a dividend is declared on a quarterly basis, so it's like a, it's something that you expect it to, you know, come do. Especially if a company has history of paying dividends. Sure, but like if if it's a company, like a stock buyback sure, one time event. if a company starts paying like higher and higher dividends, like that's also going to lead to a quote unquote artificially inflated stock price, whatever artificial means, right? Like people are more attracted towards stocks or securities that pay dividends. Like they're they're nice yeah, for investors. I think, it, I think the argument could probably be made that like a, a dividend is more like an organic process of like you know how cash funnels through a business through revenue and then onto the investors' hands, whereas like a, a, a single time stock buyback seems to really benefit you know the not not just the shareholders but the executives that have a huge portion of those shares to begin with. Okay, but if you pay um, out dividends and then and then, and a CEO has a huge portion of shares, the CEO is going to get a huge portion of those dividends, right? That's how dividends work, right? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm not opposed to like having a conversation about like, but but I'm saying that like the 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 taking of cash and declaring like a a one-time stock buyback, which is done by the board, by the way. I mean, the, the board also declares a dividend, so it's kind of you know it's one and the same. The, those two are real. I, I don't I don't view them the same exact way, really. I mean, I, I really don't think that there's like. Any what sort if of, like, what if they did stock like, buybacks on a quarterly basis? Would you be okay with them then? Um, that sounds like a dividend. <laughs> So the only difference then between you, between for for you, the only difference between a stock buyback and a dividend is that it's paid quarterly. No, well, the, the difference is that it's it's declared quarterly. I think so. It's like something that you know is coming ahead of time, and then there's like an ex dividend date whereby like if you hold the shares at that point, you know for a fact that you're getting the dividend. What do you think that all um, like do you think? Can be done. Do you well, think? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Do you think special dividends should be banned? Like, like every now and then um, if a company is having like an ultra profitable year and they pay out like a special dividend or whatever, um, like if they've got like a big like asset sale or some or some huge well, there, like there's one. some differences here too, right? Like, like when the company declares a stock buyback, I'm pretty sure they don't just go out to market and buy all the shares in one day. Um, I, I think it's like spaced out over a period of time. I don't know the exact like logistics of how it goes about, but a dividend is a more transparent way to pit, to issue money to the shareholders than a stock buyback would be. Um, but especially given the fact that a stock buyback is like you know, you're, you're literally going out to, I mean, explain to me why then they would just declare a dividend if they're going to be purchasing the stock. And, because and because stock buybacks it. are, they have better tax treatment to the investors. That's why. Stock buy, if I'm getting paid from explain a company. What? Could you, could you go into detail there? 
Yeah. So if I'm, let's say that I have like a million shares of some company and they, they've got, they're sitting on a ton of excess cash. They don't have any NPV plus projects that they can invest in. Um, and they decide, okay, well, we're going to give some of this cash back to shareholders. They could pay it out as a special dividend. Bam, big dividend. Well, fuck me. Like now I have all this money. Maybe I'm in like a really high earning part of my life. I don't really want to fucking pay tax on this right now. Fuck me. But if they do this in the form of stock buybacks and instead I experience a big appreciation of my assets, um, this is like a more of a tax deferred event, right? Like I can wait until I sell these assets at a later point in time when I'm more in a tax advantaged area. Like it basically just gives me more control over that actual tax event than if it's paid out as a dividend and then reinvested. Well, yeah, because you don't you don't pay taxes on stock that you own until you sell it. Yeah, the, I guess the the dividend portion. I mean, the, you're kind of making my argument for me to some extent because I I don't view that as a positive thing. Maybe from like a societal perspective. Well, from an I investor, you reason. yeah, you asked right. me why yeah, I, I would I prefer to get paid a, a dividend and or why I would get prefer prefer to get paid like a in stock buyback basically. Like I'd rather have my yeah, asset I mean, appreciate than get a cash payout. Yeah. Maybe I should clarify like what perspective I'm looking at this from. I'm looking at it from the perspective of like. I guess you would say society or the nation in general mm -hmm. and forming like coherent investor related policy uh, or investment related policy, like for the benefit of the country. I, I think that it, uh, this touches a lot of different things. Like, for example, a lot of guys like Jeff Bezos, he's he's living off of like a, a line of credit attached to his stock. He doesn't really have to sell his stock in order to. I mean, I think he did actually recently sell a stock, but he doesn't have to sell a stock in order to make his, you know, his his private bills. Uh, it, it, to generate cash to pay his private bills. Okay. He'll typically do a lot of credit off of his, his existing stock and never have to pay taxes on the stock itself because he never has to sell it. Um, and, and there's many such cases here. So it's like, I, I'm actually looking at it from like a wealth inequality perspective and a national perspective. Yeah, I mean, More we can talk like about perspective. redoing stuff like that if you want. I mean, that's possible, but like normal people have access to cash that they can, um, you know, secure with assets. This is what you just described. He's doing it with his securities, apparently. You can do this with your house, yeah, right? You can take so, like a home equity loan out and you can secure that debt. Yeah, but you, but you, but you pay taxes on your house on, the, on a yearly basis. You don't pay taxes on your stock that you haven't sold. Yet. Not on a yearly basis, but when he sells it, he'll pay tax on it because that's just how we, that's just yeah, how we, but I just explained to you that he doesn't have to he doesn't have to sell his, his stock in order to make the cash available in order to meet his bills like the same way you would have to sell your house in order to get cash out of no it. I don't or have to sell my house to get cash out of it that's my whole point I could take a home equity line of credit well, out yeah but you but you pay taxes on the property value of your house but not what, what do you mean every year like you, you pay property taxes right you pay property taxes sure but I mean like that's okay, you, don't pay, you don't pay taxes on your house or on your stock rather yeah but the the, the yeah. taxes that I pay in property taxes on the house are different than the taxes I would pay if I were to sell the house and collect the money out of it right like well I think in some cases you don't pay any taxes in that case but like well if, unless you're talking about like rare conversions or whatever where if you're selling a primary house and you're moving up to another primary house or whatever but like in general but there's like a parallel here between like a wealth tax right like there, there's something to be said for like a wealth tax that would affect billionaires the same way that it, we the private individual most people like mm -hmm. most individuals in the United States have the majority of their wealth tied into their houses sure. or in their primary I agree rates, right? so like li is, listening is that they get taxed on their wealth but the, the billionaires don't get taxed sure. on their so wealth, like li listening to you yeah, I understand so listening to you talk I'm, I'm pretty sure that that we probably would agree like 95% of the way on, on most things. Um, it sounds like your issue isn't necessarily with the idea of stock buybacks. It's more just like the tax treatment of, of different events in the United States, which in which case I would probably agree. So like, for instance, like, I don't know if I really care much about stock buybacks versus dividends, but maybe they should have a different tax treatment to bring them more in line with dividends. Maybe in that case, we wouldn't feel so bad. Like, it'd be much more complicated for us to like restructure the tax laws around stock buybacks and it would be just to ban them outright and allow you to reward your shareholders through dividend um that are taxable true but at the same time it's not like a way for people who already have such a huge portion of their wealth tied in the stock to be able to circumvent taxes and, and maintain their wealth well you're to be clear just because it's different we're not talking about circumventing taxes we're talking about like delaying the taxable event right people do this all the time in real life um with 401ks and yeah, iras okay, and whatever what I mean by that, though, is that you're inflating the value of your assets without having to do anything that would usually be done in the case of like appreciated share value through like a dividend yield or something like. That. De depending, yeah. Um, can I? Can yeah. I, I don't want to take up too much of your time on this. Is there any way that we could have a discussion like privately? Because I'd really like to talk to you about that, maybe on stream or something. I have a YouTube channel now, and I'm I'm kind of big on Reddit or whatever. So, is um, there any possibility of spending like 20 minutes on this? Yeah, if you want to, sure. Um, just like right, message me like some um, Oh yeah, actually, if you email me at um, contact at destiny .gg, um, yeah, we can send something up there. Yeah. All right, good deal. I'm a little busy right now, so I apologize, cool. but yeah, I'd love to do that. That's okay. Yeah, no problem, buddy. Have fun. Be careful. All right, see you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is from. Uh, let's go with. Uh, uh, let's go with Killjoy. 
Um, how do you feel about the fact that you're a person who's pretty far left, but is considered a right winger or not left enough by other progressives like Sahil from Progressive Voice, Hassan, or Chapel Trap House? Um, uh, big fan, watch your YouTube a lot. Play- um, I mean, I think it's dog shit, obviously, because I'm one of those people that's considered not left at all, right? It's, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I disagree with the people on the extreme left that like purity test other progressives or liberals and make them like conservatives or some shit. I think that's really stupid. Cool. Okay. Next is uh, let's go with Mo. Mo, you're. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. okay um, wrong guy. Uh, Mo, you're unmuted. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, sorry, I was AFK the first time. I think I was called. Um, I, I have a second question. It's kind of unrelated to my first one. Um, what do you think? Do you think that Islam is worse? for women than christianity is and um i'm just curious about like your thoughts on that uh i mean so like if anybody has any religious upbringing your first experience with religion is that religion is incredibly fucking localized like your religion in your particular parish or your particular church or synagogue or mosque is going to be way different arguably than than one even down the street depending on where you're from right Or, or one across the country or one across the world so like when you ask, like, is Islam worse for women than Christianity? I mean, like, on an aggregate today in the world, it seems to be the case, probably. Um, but, like, in terms of, like, the religions themselves, like, intrinsically by what's written in the actual documents themselves, um, that's debatable. And then in terms of how it plays out on an individual level across the world, that's almost certainly not true. Um, so, for instance, like, Muslim women in uh, the United States are probably, in general, treated better than Christian women in Sudan, like, most likely. Um, um, depending on particular areas. So, I mean, like, I don't believe that any religion is is necessarily incompatible with society, with any Western society's values. It just depends on how adapted that religion is to some particular society. Um, yeah. Okay. And um, just uh, to clarify, like, that does that at all, like, play into... Um, cause, cause like, I know the right wing, like, likes talking about like, oh, Islam causes more violence. Like, does, is that like even a thing or like, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I don't know what the stats are right now. I know in the United States, I'm pretty sure that it's agreed that right wing violence is what's on the rise right now. Um, in terms of like worldwide terrorist events, I don't know what the answer is. It wouldn't surprise me if most of it was Muslim right now, just because of the the sections of the world where it comes from. Um, but I mean, like, obviously the answer is more complicated than just religion. There's like a lot of geopolitical pressure from multiple sides and multiple parties in a a lot of these areas, geographically speaking. It just so happens that a lot of the people that are also Muslim. Um, Yeah, I I think that anytime you try to like blame religion for some of these really complicated issues, you're doing a disservice to yourself and the issues themselves by reading into it so simplistically, is what I would argue. Um, Okay, Uh, thank you. Uh, Just one last uh, thing. Um, What would you say is kind of like the direction we should be moving like forward in? Um, Like understanding that maybe religion does tie into some like percentage of the problem. Like what is kind of, I guess, the solution? Like do we just try to address like all of the economic hardships that those uh, highly volatile regions are in and like hope that like they just pull a Christianity and just like kind of um, become, I, I guess, more modernized or like, uh, like, like, can you talk about the solution for that? Or I mean, um, th- so, I mean, I can't pretend to have like the best solution, like, cause holy shit, that's a really complicated question. My, my, my hope like intrinsically, um, or, or intuitively, I should say, I'm sorry. My, my intuitive hope would be that like, as countries move, like become more financially free and liberal, um, and as the, the liberalization of trade and culture happens. So like when countries start trading with other countries more, when they start getting like media and culture from other countries more, that, that sort of kind of like mellow of extreme fundamentalist religious ideas happens and that people generally become you know more chill over time and more i would say progressive i don't necessarily mean like ultra left-wing progressive but just more progressive in their values over time i would hope that that's like a natural process as countries modernize and get more like taken into like a globalist fold i guess of the western world would be my hope gotcha all right thank you so much yep have fun. thanks Ma. okay Devin, uh you've been nagging me for like the past hour you're unmuted go for it Hey, Destiny, how's it going? Uh, I just wanted to start off by saying I'm a professional in the military. Wait, hold on. You're quite cut off for a second. You said that you're a what in the military? Intelligence professional. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I just wanted to, just as like a little background, I just wanted to ask you about recent reduction of violence in Afghanistan and how the Afghan government released 200 Taliban prisoners. 
Um, what it, what specifically you're asking me about? Just what your thoughts are on it. I mean, it's really big deal. We're trying to get peace talks with the Taliban now, and the fact that we had 200 of the the supposedly terrorists we've been fighting for years now mm -hmm. that we just released kind of out of nowhere. Just want your thoughts on it. I mean, didn't we essentially exit Afghanistan? Isn't that done now? Are we just kind of hoping that the Afghanistani government, is it the Afghan government or the Afghanistani government um, and the Taliban, Afghan, yeah. Afghan, yeah, kind of like work out a deal? Um, my, uh, without being super informed on Afghanistan, I would imagine that the Taliban will more or less end up, if not running it in name, like effectively be running the country in a few years. It seems to be the case. Like, um, it felt like from everything I'd heard prior to us exiting that like Kabul was going to fall and shit and like the, the rest of the country is going to be pretty fucked, um, like without U.S. presence there. So I don't know how the country stands on its own or maybe it does and I'm not as informed on it. Yeah, I mean, the country's been fucked for a while right now, to mm -hmm. be honest, but... <laughs> Yeah, with all this happening, we're pretty, we're in the process of getting out right now. But yeah, we're in the process. And my just one other thought: uh, Why the fuck were those like two like mono Diaz, whatever the fuck they were, talking for thirty minutes? They needed to just shut the fuck up. I just I just need to say that. Okay, listen, I like boring philosophy discussions, and those guys gave me the philosophy discussion that I needed, injected right into my veins. So, but I love you, buddy. Okay, be careful. All right, thanks. Thanks. Okay, next is a voting Canadian. You're unmuted. Um, hey, that's me. So um, I recently saw a post about a six-year-old being trans. Well, it was a comment. And there were a lot of split opinions. So um, basically, um, there was a pro-trans guy saying, I'm sorry a six-year-old came out as trans. Sounds like a lot of brainwashing bullshit and attention seeking from Reddit. I'm completely pro-trans, but there's a line where kids can't make that decision themselves. And then there were a bunch of comments saying that's completely absurd and six-year-olds don't like yet know what they are and um yeah all that stuff about reddit and stuff. yeah i so like it feels to me every single time i hear these arguments it feels like concern trolling to me so like should a six-year-old be able to go on puberty blockers and come out publicly and say, probably not i don't know if i would trust a six-year-old to be able to know that now that being said we intimately experience things like gender literally in the womb there are like measured differences in behaviors between like male and female um babies in the womb but now like but but regardless of that like there's always going to be edge cases where like this is wrong and stupid um i think was it um was it Le was it Dwayne wayne or was it lebron who has like a kid who's like 11 and like publicly came out as trans and it's like damn dude a lot of people that come out as early ages as trans as another person earlier pointed out like actually end up feeling cisgender later on like they they uh, they their feelings of dysphoria are alleviated they don't actually need like srs or hrt they just they realize okay no hold on i am cis i don't i think that whatever i was experiencing before is not real or not or not like true to me so like to come out very publicly as an 11 year old on a fucking celebrity instagram seems like a whole lot of fucking pressure for stuff like that Dwayne Wait, yeah, sorry. Um, so, like, obviously, yeah, there are cases like this where, you know, this is stupid. Or we're like a, a woman who's been on HRT or a trans woman who's been on HRT for like two months that goes and breaks like world lifting records. It's probably dumb. Um, now, while we can all agree that in these cases, it's probably stupid to, to, to entertain these ideas, um, I don't think that that works to like, like hand wave off like every single adolescent person who might engage with puberty blockers um, to make decisions about their gender, you know, a year or two down the line. Or to say that all trans people are trying to mutilate the genitals of children, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I definitely agree that there are some pretty crazy, pretty niche edge cases where like this is pretty fucked and it probably shouldn't happen. But I don't think those serves as arguments against like the greater whole of like the trans movement or the APA's position on trans or like worldwide positions on trans people. Um, and it feels like usually when people bring these up, they represent them in a really disingenuous manner. Like, oh, everybody wants to put four year olds on puberty blockers now. It's crazy. They think they have a two year old trans kid because they wanted a pink uh, bib instead of a blue one or whatever. Like, I think that that just feels like concern trolling to me. Mm. All right. Thanks for answering okay. the question. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next is um, <laughs> it's Vosh sort of. Uh, Vosh had it like a semi comment. Uh, Destiny calls himself a capitalist, but yet he hasn't opened a bit his business to the public investment. Um, nobody can buy stock in Destiny LLC. Explain this hypocrisy. Um, in a capitalist system, you can have private firms that haven't opened themselves up to public investment. 
Um, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing contradictory to that. In a capital environment, um, there's tons of companies that have private capital instead of public funding, um, and it's totally um, consistent with any capitalist framework. Um, or for me, like in a mixed market framework. Now, it's curious that most people that say that they're socialists or socialist leaning um, never engage in even cooperative models for their YouTube channels, even if they're making a fuck ton of money. So for instance, Vosh not only makes enough money to be like very well off, he makes enough money to be very well off and to have a cooperative thing kind of centered around his YouTube channel. Um, if he was ever curious about it, he could actually email me and I could even tell him how I think it would be cool to structure it, um, you know, with different equity amounts given to people like editors, to thumbnail producers, to channel holders. Um, not only could this totally exist within the current capitalist framework, um, you can't really use the excuse, well, just because I'm in a capitalist system, uh, you know, doesn't mean I can't criticize it because he has enough money to like escape the pressures of said capitalist system and run the channel in a cooperative like manner, which a socialist should do if they think that it's both morally good to do so and economically efficient to do so. But yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, next question from, uh, let's go with, a, oh, it's a Vosh related question uh, from Dessa. Uh, Destiny, do you regret in any way how you initially dealt with a Vosh uh, Irish? Uh, you essentially made him look like a borderline sexual predator who needed to be expunged from the community to protect women. When in reality, he was, he posted cringe sexually suggested, uh, suggestive texts uh, to females who frequent, who are frequent users of your server um, and frequent users of your server know we're also posting said sexually suggestive cringe back to him. Um, I disagree with that characterization of his uh, conversation with that one person. However, I've never come out and said over and over again that Vosh is a sexual predator. Um, like, I said I had to ban him from my Discord server for a few months just because of shit that happened, but, like, I don't have, like, any long-term... I don't think that he's this horrible, sexually deviant fucking blah, 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 blah. Like, I don't hold people to those standards. Like, I've literally fucking groped a woman on camera before because I was drunk out of my mind. Like, I'm not going to sit here and, like, say, like, oh, once you've done this bad thing, you're a fucking predator for your whole... Like, this is stupid as fuck. Um, the only reason why I had... Why I felt like I had to go public with it is because because at that time, I had like a pretty huge disagreement in my community between lefties and non-lefties, I guess. And it felt like banning one of the largest lefties out of nowhere without any type of communication would look really bad. It would look like I was trying to like purge people. So I feel like I had to go public with it. And I kind of feel like I had to do it in the way that I did. Obviously, it might not have been like the, the best thing for him. But I feel like my community would have been like really fucked um, if I would have handled that in any different way. Like my idea was basically like I need to show the behavior that happened once the once the entire entire community had like universally condemned the behavior then I needed to come out and say who it was and then I needed to go ahead and apply like some form of ban for like a month or two or three so that people would kind of understand if I would have just said oh I'm banning Vosh because of bad behavior I think a lot of people would have been very ideologically motivated to engage in certain types of defense that you hear now now that it is exposed um, but when I first talked about it in an anonymous manner man dude there are some really funny logs there was this one guy posting my chat like oh this guy's probably a trained Rex user this guy hates women blah 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 but then as soon as the name was revealed this guy was like like, dude, this is so fucked up. Why would you reveal this? Like, dude, that's so wrong. Like, what's wrong with you? So it was like, I, I think that it sucks the way that I handled it was like, it sucks. The situation sucks all around, but I mean, I think I did it in the way that I kind of had to. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, so we're wrapping, we're getting close to the end of the AMA. Destiny said to go like 20 minutes over mm -hmm. um, because, you know, we had the philosophy session. Sure. So I know some of you guys want to get on voice. Um, I'm going to let you on, but please keep in mind, you know, the time constraint. Uh, MAGA 2020, you're up next. Go for it. Uh, hi. So uh, I just had a question concerning, like, say, whether or not you'd be supportive of, with regards to the airline bailout, a policy in which would nationalize them. And more specifically, with regards to the companies that do fail, we allocate the resources that would otherwise, then in turn, be used to bail these companies out. We simply pay the wages of those who are no longer employed in this market. Um, well, for the latter question, I mean, isn't that what unemployment is for? Like, if they're no longer employed in the market, then they get unemployment? Sure, but that's for like a specific percentage of their wage, and it also doesn't necessarily apply to every single person who worked within that sector. Um, so the point being. Yeah, I mean, I would say that like in times of like an unprecedented disaster like this, I don't think every single airline employee expected to lose their fucking job and be like, well, fuck me. Like, I don't think it would necessarily be bad to subsidize their wages for some number of months, like completely until they can find more work. I, I think that's I think that'd probably be OK. I don't see a big deal with that. Also, my issue is with the fact that this allows for like, say, the, I don't know if this is the correct term, but the publicization of this essentially and then in turn allows for companies to irrespective of the decisions they made and i don't think it's necessarily their fault this is something they can predict but either way 
it still is, I think we live in a capitalist society. If so, I feel as if they should be allowed to fail. And if we are going to allow them to fail, and if it's such an issue, I think the nationalization is a solution to that problem. Um, okay, but so there's... Just be- yeah, so there's two parts here. So I think publicizing risk is prob- is, is good. Um, like... <sighs> I don't want companies in the United States to be hoarding cash uh, for these black swan events. As I said to the earlier caller, like if you've got a, if you've got cash in your company, I want you investing in good projects. I want you, you know, like paying out your shareholders and the people that are buying stocks in your company. Um, and I want you like moving the economy forward. I don't want you hoarding a bunch of cash because you're worried that something, you know, might get fucked in the future. So I, I think that like the government can step in and alleviate like these shock events that happen. I think that's okay. I think it's okay for government to fill in the role there. Um, I feel like when a lot of people get upset about the subsidization of risk of corporate Operations. They don't really care about that, but they're using that as a proxy issue for, well, hold on. Why does it feel like there are so many fucking systems in place for the government to help fucking shareholders get their money and businesses to stay afloat, but there's fuck all for the average person? I think that's a better argument, and I think that's totally fucking legitimate, which is why when you asked me earlier, like, do you think that we should have like a, a sort of wage bailout for— um, for employees, yeah, I think that's fine. Um, like part of the loans that are going out now for the government for small businesses, a lot of these loans, if you take out a loan from a bank and you use those loans to pay wages to your employees, that loan is 100% forgivable. I think that money with strings attached to it like that, I think is actually pretty cool because now you're giving money to businesses, but that money is actually being used to pay employees. You're not just giving them a blank check and going, well, good luck, LOL. You know, So I, I think stuff like that is okay. I'm well aware that it's not that. There are, of course, constraints on that, of which would be grants to these companies. But I'm saying the gains that these companies are going to proceed to go on and make mm-hmm. are always going to be private. So if yeah. we're not going to engage in nationalization, mm-hmm. then I think we ought, in a capitalist society, to let them fail. And those who are affected by this, we bail them out. And if it becomes such an issue, it's not as if the infrastructure that exists with regards to the airline sector is just going to disappear we could literally just make a new airline no this is dumb people so i don't know why i've seen or i'm sorry i don't mean you're dumb i've seen this argument floating around on reddit a lot where people are like oh well if the airlines go to business all the airplanes are still there someone will just come by and bite up and everything will continue on workers get fucked in mergers and bankruptcy filings as well like it's not like when a company goes bankrupt and then reorganizes that every single worker is kept on board and, and they're perfectly fine like oftentimes you'll see like a dramatic restructuring of wages you might see big layoffs happen um you might see like companies get split and like different like you might lose your health insurance you might like lose your yeah so for the people is for what that's what for the bailout for the people or specifically dead uh, like that yeah is sure yeah I, I understand i'm just saying these are two separate things just because you let a company go bankrupt like doesn't mean that someone's going to step in like you have to have an extra government measure there to to protect like the sure. people yeah that extra government ne- measure could be nationalization and yeah and we could have the profits of this industry be public yeah i understand okay so there's i'm sorry there's like so many different like majorly disconnected points so di- nationalizing the airlines is majorly different than like should we bail out like troubling companies or whatever in times of great crisis okay i think we should do the latter now in terms of like nationalizing the airlines i haven't seriously entertained the argument but it seems to be the case that all of the arguments you would make for why you should nationalize a company seem to exist with the airlines i think airlines offer an amazing public good uh, or, or, or public service maybe i should say like we want to be able to travel and fly around that's really good and it also seems very very hard to operate airlines in a profitable manner because it's really fucking hard for these companies to make money even when things are going pretty well like their profit margins are pretty fucking thin and they lose a lot of money they're bleeding money constantly so i don't know i haven't thought about the argument too too seriously but i would be interested in hearing counter arguments for why the airlines shouldn't be nationalized or there shouldn't be at least one nationalized airline in the united states Um, maybe (laughs) these points are are connected the point is that if the company is going to fail and we are turn engaging in what is publicizing the risk then i think that the gains ought to be in the like say in the hands of the public so if it is an issue to where they were to collapse i see no reason for as to why the service that was being provided by these companies couldn't otherwise be filled in by a nationalized government. Yeah, so the, a national- yeah, so I understand. So the reason why I say these arguments are totally disconnected is because like I don't think that just because you have to bail out companies due to one time massive fucking system failures. So for instance, like around two thousand eight or around now in 2020, I don't think that means, oh, you failed once, time to nationalize you. I think that's a really dangerous way to go about things. I think a, like two thousand eight isn't very analogous to that of the current situation. The airline industry, while important I don't think is comparable to that of the entire banking sector, which were just 
basically collapse the entire world's economy. Yeah, but I mean, like, right now, like, the, the airlines going out of business right now is because of, like, one time absolutely a historic events that have never happened in human history at the scale that they're happening now. I don't think it's fair to say just because you got fucked. The, like, should we nationalize all the restaurants going out of business now, too? Because this is having, like, huge blowback on everybody in the economy. It would have on the economy. What? Or the, like, the likelihood that we could then in turn be able to, say, efficiently run mm -hmm. thousands of different restaurants in the same way. It's not all analogous to that of the airline sector, which is a heavily, like, say, I don't want to say monopolized because I don't think that's the correct term, but basically monopolized sector. I don't. I, how, how is the airline monopolized sector? There are tons of airlines that come and go all the time. No. Um, most of these airlines are either like say, um, are like a company of which is under the branch of like say Delta. Is is that, um, wait like American? Air, well, hold on, my understanding is like American yeah. Airlines, United, Southwest, um, Delta. These are all like independent companies. They're not they're not subsidiaries of, of like one parent company. No? no, no, these are like big airlines that then in turn have their own subsidiaries, of which are other con like quote unquote competing airlines. But for the most part, the super majority of flights are on like three or four airlines in America. Is it like our, our Frontier or Spirit? I feel like there's like a decent number of airlines considering the ultra high barrier to entry. I don't think that, I think that there are, what? Which is exactly why this then in turn leads to monopolization. Yeah, but it doesn't seem like the airlines are monopolized at all. There's like four or five or six like competing airlines in the US right now, which when given- I monopolized, I mean, there are a, a heavily select amount of companies which engage in this. Having five or six choices, like every time you go to like pick something, I think is like pretty good. I don't think that's like a monopoly, no? I, I'm using the term for like a sector of which is relatively owned just by a few by a few companies. But I have to go real quickly. Um, oh, sure. But it was nice to see you. Thanks. Okay. Have fun, bye. Cool. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to do a couple more. That's okay. Um, next is uh, uh, Shiva's right foot. Um, Shiva, you are unmuted. All right, let me uh, let me scroll back up here a second. Okay, and so the question is that you know, if you knew with some kind of empirical certainty that an extremely powerful entity created the universe and punished people with eternal torment and an afterlife for the commission of certain acts described as sins in a holy text, acting with perfect accuracy, would this constitute a case where objective morality exists? Or would no ought statements be capable of being drawn from this description of a possible world? Yeah, I think it would be absolutely indicative of descriptive or, or, or like actual moral fact existing and like being able to make good ought statements, like objectively true ought statements. Yeah. Okay. So, like, but even here, it's a descriptive description of that world and where we're drawing an ought statement from. What makes these descriptive statements able to draw oughts? Well, I mean, they seem to be prescriptive by definition. If God tells you to do something, then it ought to be done, no? Uh, I mean, this is just saying that he'll send you to hell for it. I mean, maybe he's giving you a choice between, you know, going to heaven or going to hell. And he's kind of agnostic on what you choose, but it's just like, you know, if, you're, if you fuck with him, he'll fuck with you. I mean, it, it's, I could be wrong, but it seems to me that if you define a godlike character— and this godlike character has access to all knowledge that exists or can exist, and he's telling you that this is what's right and this is what's wrong, then if there were ever to be like a moral fact, it would be the moral fact that he claims. So like if the Ten Commandments came from God, those would be like odd statements that are just undeniably true. Be morally, factually, it would be good to like obey your parents or good to keep holy the Sabbath or good to not murder or whatever, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, but I mean, the we, there's an, an, a conflict here with the fact that you've said earlier in this discussion on this AMA uh, that if you are a uh, an egoist, that you are forced to adopt some kind of altruism by by logic, which seems to suggest that logically there's you know a punishment that your egoism won't be satisfied in some way uh, for not adopting altruism, which does kind of seem to imply that there is like this necessity, you know this that you adopt altruism, otherwise you will be punished, which seems to imply moral altruism or moral uh, objective morality, pardon me. I don't think anything, I don't think you need objective morality to get from like, I have personal preferences. And as long as I respect the personal preferences of other people and try to keep those like 
close to me, they'll do the same for me, that I can create like a better world for myself than if I were to just go out on my own. I don't think you need any type of moral factor or moral realism to get to that point. Well, I mean, it's suggestive of a moral realism that, like you say, logically, an egoist is forced into a kind of altruism. Like that, mm -hmm. is that, how is that? I mean, it, or I shouldn't say you're, you're forced. You're not actually forced because you're, you're just forced to choose between your egoism being satisfied and, you know, not being altruistic. Uh, but yeah, I mean, th that seems to be exactly the same thing that's going on with like a creator God telling you, you should be a good person. Otherwise you're going to get punished. I guess, what do you, when you say like moral realism or whatever, what do you, what does that mean to you? I guess. Oh, that, uh, it, the universe is constructed in some way that people who are behaving in some sort of altruistic way are inherently rewarded with the fulfillment of their desire. Okay, if that if I guess if that's your if that's the definition we're going on for more, more realism, then I would be a moral realist. Um, I always hear people float like different types of definitions for what they consider moral realism. I guess, um, but I mean, I think I think you would almost have to accept that that like people acting in in a certain way is going to maximize like a particular preference or outcome. No. Well, I mean, yeah, you're acting egoistically in the same way that somebody who's acting to go to heaven would be acting egoistically like they want to go to heaven like it's you know if you're behaving in the way that traditional religion is behaving like you're behaving egoist in, in this interpretation sure, of but traditional the, religion. but the and difference sure. but the difference would be that the person who is acting self-interestedly would just say like well i do this because it satisfies a personal preference whereas the religious person says well i do this because it's moral law like the egoist can say well i don't really believe that morals are real i just think there are things that i have to do that help me satisfy my I mean, preference but they don't they're not like moral laws or moral fact or anything no I will grant that people do make contorted arguments about like the inherentness of Christianity, but I think that there's a lot of like I don't know. I mean, you can always doubt any empirical fact, but there seems to be a lot of evidence that a lot of people are motivated by the possibility of being punished by hell and you know uh, rewarded with heaven. Yeah, it seems to be the uh, case. In follow, and in in like the, the issue is that if you know, I mean, it seems that the point of a lot of you know, the absence of moral realism arguments uh, are to attack people who believe in that sort of Christianity, which, you know, if you're not attacking that sort of Christianity, it's, it's, what, what is this argument here for? If you're not, wait, can you say that again? Sorry. Well, that, that the lack of moral realism seems to be designed to attack people who are adhering to traditional uh, religions in, in basically this way, that they're afraid of hell and they're, you know, well, I think to go to heaven. Usually, I, if I'm attacking religious people, it's not over those grounds. Usually, it's over, like, um, like empirical claims. Like, if you think, like, a god exists or something, and then maybe, like, epistemic claims over, like, how can you know that a god exists or something? It's not usually over, like, ethical claims, I think. Like, that's, like, a discussion that happens way down the road from... Do you have a good reason I mean, to believe the Dr. Wayne exists of a God? Sure. Well, like, I mean, I, I guess I, I can't, you know, draw the direct line, and it's it's all implicit. But uh, yeah, I mean, it seems that like, it, like it seems that the the, the argument that against moral uh, objective morality here is not something that would, you know, defeat a kind of literal interpretation of the Christian religion. Well, the difference is that the literal interpretation of the Christian religion claims to have like an understanding of moral fact. And I don't know, like I said, I don't feel like having a shared set of preferences among people and even being altruistic to maximize said preferences, I don't think that's necessarily indicative of an underlying moral fact, the same way that like an ecosystem of fungi that survive in an optimal way in some like swamp, you know, denotes some moral fact about their existence. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, the cooperative nature, the fact that like, you know, multicellular life has been pretty successful, like implies that there is kind of this propensity towards altruism that's very you know, extraordinarily if not completely universal um, um sure but just because there's a cooperation doesn't imply moral fact at all like is there moral fact implied by the fact that the planets orbit the sun that they seem to have they seem to work with each other so that they don't fall into the gravity of the sun so they maintain their orbits like and that they even have smaller moons or children or satellites or whatever like the, I, I don't know if that i don't know if that necessarily implies a moral fact at all it just is it's a fact of the world that cooperative life tends to so, outcompete non-cooperative. Yeah. I guess I have to go back to the, the original question because now I'm not seeing how that is uh, objective morality. If like my original scenario with the extremely powerful entity, which is, you know, punishing people with this eternal torment, 
Like, how, how is that objective morality exactly? Uh, well, I don't think the objective morality has anything to do with, like, him threatening to punish people or him, like, um, you know, having the Ten Commandments. The objective morality part comes from the idea— maybe, I'm, maybe we're, like, step, walking back to his arguments. If a divine being says something to me that is true— then it's then it's by virtue of him stating it it's true if god declares some moral fact i mean if if we assume that a god is omnipotent and omniscient if he can see all things and know all things then then this god whatever he says is going to be true so whatever he says a moral fact is a moral fact must be so like that right, that right, would be where the moral right. fact so comes. Like, it like, doesn't come from him threatening like, to torture perhaps us. this is a, this is a, uh, being uh -huh. leveraged over the word sin that i used but uh, you know if we ignore the word sin and just say there's some acts and we're not even going to define what those acts are, are going to result in you going to hell. And we're also going to be agnostic over whether you choose to commit those acts or not. We're mm -hmm. just going to tell you, you commit the acts, you're going to hell. You don't commit the acts, you're going to hell. Mm -hmm. That is no longer objective morality because we're not like telling you to choose to go to, you know, we're not making... No, I mean, a, a person can choose which way they would want to go to. I mean, I imagine if this person was like deductively sound, they would probably make the choices to go to heaven or hell. Or I'm sorry, they'd probably make the choice to go to heaven and not hell. Um, but I mean... There would be no moral fact there. It would just be making a choice between doing one thing or another, right? Between shooting right. a parent. So, so in this case, there, there, it, this scenario where a, a god laid out like the, the a, set, a set of acts, heaven, hell, so forth. This is not uh, objective morality. Um, if the god is, uh, I, um, I guess not. I'm sorry, I'm having a really hard time because I mean, I, it's not god. I'm using the word god. A person. Okay, yeah. Being, if a person came down and yeah, let's say a person came down and revealed to you that like, hey, by the way, if you do this, you go to heaven. If you do this, you go to hell. Then no, I don't think there would be any morality there. You would just be. It would almost be like a teacher saying, if you pass your grades, you go to college. If you fail, you go to the gulags or whatever. Like, yeah, I don't think there's any implication of an objective morality there. I, I was thinking more Tilda Swinton like punches your soul out of your body and you for a moment see like souls being cast down into damnation and other ones that you know are, are allowed to go on and you somehow know by their aura or something that they they've you know some of the ones are doing certain things and the other ones are doing other things like you know some metaphysical empirical observation of of the truth you know which is you know, very likely impossible <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in that uh, in that yes. case, I probably would agree that that would be an objective morality. Yeah, because now you're giving me a way that I can use sense data to interpret an event that seems to point towards moral fact. If somebody goes to eternal, but what is, what is the moral fact? Well, I mean, I would imagine, based on my human understanding, that if there's a place of eternal salvation and a place of eternal hell, the place of eternal salvation is probably reserved for the people that most respected moral fact, and the place of eternal damnation is probably reserved for the people that were disrespective of moral fact. That would be my assumption, I, my theological well, I mean, I, get, I mean, we can. We, we can assume that you know certain things want certain things, like to continue to exist, to fulfill their egoism, and so forth. Mm -hmm. But like... Yeah, I mean, like, we're at a point, though, bitches. where, you know, where does the moral fact come in? Like, you have this choice of going to hell, potentially, and, mm -hmm. and committing sin. And that's, you know, potentially as valid, in some sense, as the choice of not committing sin and going to heaven. Like, so... Yeah, I guess, I, guess, I don't know how where, much I'm preloading my understandings here, because maybe I'm not fairly treating your analogy, but, like, hell, by definition, is for bad people. Um, heaven, by definition, is for good people. The existence of an eternal salvation represents goodness. The existence of an eternal damnation represents badness. That if one person could go to one and not the other, it would be indicative of some underlying moral fact of the matter. That if I could do X action and it sends me to heaven, X action ought to be good or should be good. If I do Y action and it sends me to hell, then Y action should be bad because by definition, Y acts or bad acts get me to hell, X acts or good acts get me to heaven, which is good. That, that would, well, I, yeah. I apologize. I've been using heaven and hell as like shorthand because I originally described them as a place of eternal torment, uh -huh. which wasn't necessarily labeled as anything in particular, but it is intu in, you know, intuitively clear. Yeah, it's, it's got some analogy to the Christian hell. But yes, I mean, like the actual labels themselves, I think, are, are pretty immaterial. Like uh, the question is, like, you know, if we have this. Def we have you know defeat of egoism defeat of selfish desire of you know experiencing pleasure which is usually what, what people want you know on one hand when when you do certain things and then we have reward of egoism reward of certain desires on the other hand for doing other things like that seems to be like you know a, a law of morality that you know you could call objective morality i don't know i, I don't understand the resistance of calling that objective morality because these are things that, because it's just descriptively true things that satisfy like essential properties of, of, of said things like that you don't need morality to describe it like if i talk about how like flowers grow in a certain way so that their petals face the sun or that trees leaves in a forest will organize itself around other trees leaves um to maximize the amount of sunlight chlorophyll or whatever they can produce like none of this requires a moral fact to describe what's happening you're just describing 
describing things that are doing things to satisfy their preferences. And then it's the same with humans. If I treat enough people well enough and they treat me kind enough and it makes me feel good, happy, I have a good experience or whatever, I don't need any type of moral fact to explain any of those interactions at all. Right. So, and again, again, so this implies then that like, if it's just a matter of you can choose the quote heaven uh, or quote hell through your actions and so forth, that scenario is not a case of objective morality. That scenario, um, if you can choose it, I guess not, maybe? Right. So uh, to back up further, from what you had just said before that, 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 you know, we, we can't, there are no ought statements in one, you know, this stuff. That implies that the scenario that I have been outlining as an analogy where we have this kind of observation soul being punched out of the body by Tilda Swinton, um, that means that that situation is not objective morality. Uh, sure. And, and that, and if we, if we can take, I, I'll, I'm hesitantly answering yes, as long as we take away all of the loaded assumptions regarding these places. Yeah. If there's just a place of eternal suffering and a place of eternal happiness and we don't call them heaven or hell or imply there's like an omniscient godlike figure making commandments about these places, then yeah, there is still no immorality implied there. Sure. Okay. I mean, there are, pl and I've, I've pointed this out in discussions with you previously. <laughs> I guess there are a couple of people here who've talked to you in the past. Uh, but yeah, uh, like there, there are definitely are parts of the Bible where it says, you know, he, I've laid out before you a choice, like, you know, between life and death. And it, it seems pretty, like, clear that it's, it's, a, it's a choice. Um, and I don't, I like. Sure, but if we know, you know that God, who has knowledge of all things in the world, is designing places that maximally satisfy our preferences and maximally go against our preferences, and we know that God has designed us, then it seems as though there is an underlying fact of the matter of where a human ought to end up. God himself, who knows all things, knows what humans desire, creates a place of infinite desire, and then creates a place of infinite torment. It seems like if there was ever a fact of the matter about where one ought to go, that God himself would know, and it seems as though he's designed it pretty clearly to tell us where we ought to go. So, like, that okay, would be, like, like, a morally, like, realist way of looking at things. Like, there are moral facts of the matter there. Okay, and, okay God is yeah, but if we person. take away the word infinite, basically, like, your entire argument is that is, is summed up with egoism implies uh, some kind of altruism. Like, that your entire argument applies to egoism implies altruism, that you you're, you will be egoistically rewarded if you are altruistic in some way. That is the logical design of the universe. So that... Well, no, no, no. I totally disagree with that. When you say logical design of the universe, that's just the way the universe is. Um, that's the way that things have organized themselves because that tends to be the way that um, that things work. But we, we that that was how they work so far. We don't even know if that's superior. There might be another planet um, aeons away, from, as aeon, light years away from us, right? Where there's a bunch of humans or, or human-like creatures that live there and hunt each other and aren't cooperative at all. Um, maybe in our planet, maybe in five years, because of our cooperation, because of our flourishing of science and te technology, the existence of nation states maybe we all nuke each other and we all die and maybe that other planet continues to exist for tens of thousands of years because they never make it to that technological level because they're not that altruistic well then who's to say that altruism was the better path like right now our planet has organized itself be because of the way dna and everything works around cooperation being like a superior method of like organizing life but there's to say that that's like a design or that's the best way i mean that's just the way things are um like we could think of a million different counterfactuals for how things could have been this just happens to be how they're they're made right now that doesn't mean it was designed that way or that it has to be that way well yes but that's true of any empirical statement that we do you know this is just the way it's been so far maybe the maybe it's grew and maybe how does grew go that all, all blue things turn green or is it all green no 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 no. this is, i'm not making a statement about causality i'm just pushing back on the word you used of design just because something is a certain way doesn't necessarily mean it was designed that way if i drop a handful of marbles on the floor and they land a certain way then that is to some to some extent it was designed that way and that i dropped them they could have been any other way but they happen to be a particular way like this is just the way the universe happens to be organized it could have been organized a different way i'm not trying to say that that is any statement and that's nothing to do with causality i don't think i'm just pushing back on the idea of things are designed because they are a way that they are well i don't i mean like i, I don't understand how this is this is at this point i'm not sure how this is relevant to the argument because like you know i obviously like the whole concept of you know if you're going back to a religion the whole concept is that there's a creator god and he could have done things differently but he did it this way you know he made choices in his act of creation i'm sure uh and like he set up you know object morality to be this way like, okay and it seems that, you know, that's that's OK, fine. If the universe but it seems like the universe has happened to turn out such that objective morality is real <laughs> in that case. I mean, if we're, if we're going oh, in that, that case, yeah, well, because God would have made it so sure. No, no, no I mean, going back to our, our previous argument that, that 
uh, you know the universe that we exist in, like even if this is just by happenstance, it seems that by happenstance, I don't understand why the fact that it's by happenstance is relevant to the fact that morality seems to exist. Okay, sure. As, so like, like here, so law. sure. So so here's like my question, rather than being on the defense, right? What, how, what is a moral fact? How do you how do you t see like morality? What what do you interpret morality with? What that it's what do we, <laughs> that. So, like, if I, I were to ask you what is the color of something, like, okay, so here's how I believe that knowledge uh, arises from humans. We have some a priori information, basic laws of deduction, basic laws of ideas, stuff like this, and then we have our sense data. So what we do is we incorporate sense data. We see things, we feel things, we hear things, we smell things, and then we run that through our a priori granted logics, and then we deductively, like, come up with statements about the world. So my question is, is where does morality come from? We, we, we have no sense organ to interpret it at all, um, and we can't get morality from a priori reasoning like we can like mathematics. So where does morality come from? How do you see it? How do you feel it? How do you discuss it? I'm sorry. I have a better answer for what is a moral, uh, okay. moral thing. The moral thing is, is the compulsion to behave altruistically. Like what, why, why do we have that thing? Like what, what is it? But we can describe that it... without morality at all. I can give you a series of chemical reactions that occur in the brain. I can tell you how people feel. Well, I think when... that is a good definition of morality. I mean, I guess we can, you know, we can use, we can use a word and say you can replace any word with its definition, I suppose. But I think it's a good definition of morality. But like, you, you know, just, just, you've just, just you know, the reasons why you behave in some way altruistically is morality. Okay, I guess. But like every single thing that you've said there can be subsumed by like biology. So why do we even need morality to like Occam's razor? Like well, exactly, yes. So therefore, objective morality exists. It's it's like a logical truth of our physical existence in this physical universe. Okay, if you define morality as we have sets of preferences and we try to def like we try to satisfy those, then sure, I agree that that objective morality exists. Mm, but I don't think the that's the reason. What... The reason that you behave altruistically is morality. Okay. Um, I don't. I don't think anybody else defines like moral realism or moral fact in that manner. But I mean, if you, if you do, then I would agree. I guess with that form of moral realism that there are optimal ways yeah. to act altruistically. But... That okay. yeah. So. All right. If you, if you guys want to move on, go ahead. Uh, but okay. thank you very much. This has been this has been great. I appreciate it. I'll try to be in contact at some point. Uh, but thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for doing this. And and big fan in general. I really appreciate what you do. It's it's great to watch it. And take care. Yeah, I love you, buddy. Thanks a lot. Cool. Thank you. Um. So I'll do two. I can do two more if you want. Go for it. Two more. Oh, okay. Base. Oh, DB, can I have one? No, wait, no. I promised Base you could do it. He's been waiting. Can I do the last one, then, please? Sure. Base, you're unmuted. Go for it. I'm kind of tired now. He can do it. Oh my god. Okay, Bib, go. For it. Wait, what was he? What was the other guy gonna ask? <laughs> no, I, I had another question, but I, I kind of waited too long, and I kind of fell asleep listening to this. Wait, really what was like the asking. what was the question? It, it was just about your position on uh, immigration, because I haven't really heard you touch on it much uh, recently from stuff I've listened. In terms of like. Um, you know, something like allowing immigration and then just using social safety nets to help the workers that get screwed over by it or something. I mean, I think that our tax policy in general needs like a big overhaul in the United States. I think that people at the very top that take advantage of the system, I don't think taking advantage of the system is bad, but people that take advantage of it should probably be taxed a little bit harder and that people on the bottom should probably see like a little bit more of the fruits of wealth that exist in the United States. So for instance, like in, in one of the richest countries in the world, we should probably have some form of socialized health care. Like that should just exist. That would be one way that like people from the top could help people at the bottom. Or same thing as like heavy subsidies on education or unemployment insurance or stuff like that. Um, and the same thing would apply with immigration, you know, if you We've got immigrants moving in, and they're causing a lot of economically good events to happen in the United States. Um, if there are some workers that get displaced by that, or some people that have negative outcomes of that, then those people should probably have like some sort of like compensation from the government as a result. I mean, the main contention I had with this was that the few times I've heard you actually talk about this specifically, like a debate you had years ago with Sar, it just seems like the common position for. Uh, people like you to take. I'm not gonna. I don't know if you're a sock dem or not, but I'll just say. Sock yeah, I'm a sock dem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, f uh, the common position seems to be something along the lines of instead of like fixing the root problem here, it's just more so allowing the problem to continue of uh, avoiding looking to the future as to what this could result in. Well, what is the root problem? In. Well, the root well the root problem is that it didn't, and it it's kind of goes back to the debate you had, and I don't again I don't, I don't know how much you've touched on it since then. But um, it's that the fact of the matter is that most of these immigrants are going to like I think it's like around 30 percent of them have college degrees. Most of them are like 
a, like a lot they are overrepresented in like entrepreneurships and opening businesses things like that which is all good but there's a large contingency of them that are doing low skilled labor which in the next 20 to 30 years is going to basically be replaced by AI and it just seems like it kind of ignores the fact that we're going to have a massive influx of people which some studies seem to suggest that like second immigrant second generation immigrants are good for the economy but first generation immigrants overall are not very good for the economy like they don't they don't help as much as they take out so um, I've never seems- seen I've never seen any economic study that implies that even first generation immigrants have a negative impact on the economy. Um, I think it's really important to make a distinction between fiscal impact versus economic impact. I have heard that first generation immigrants can have a negative fiscal impact. So, for instance, they might hurt some of the city budgets or state or local budgets. Um, but in terms of economic impact, it's almost always beneficial. Like an, an economy is driven by its resources, and immigration. I mean, like labor is a resource. Like having more consumers, you know, creates a, a bigger. Uh, demand side for, for like stuff and increases the supply side, but increasing labor, like it, it almost by definition, bringing in more people is always going to increase the activity well, in the economy. Well, the, again, the issue that I keep seeing here is that the, the issue is that we have plenty of immigrants coming from places like China or India that overrepresent in entre- like the amount of businesses that they create. Mm-hmm. And I, I would contend that it seems like the large amount of the GDP uh, influence that immigrant immigrants have, uh, seems to primarily come from this smaller sect of immigrants and that these just get lumped into the larger set of, uh, I think it's like 50 something percent now that are coming from, uh, Central America and Mexico, although Mexico is going down now. Wait, so these um, are like two separate arguments. So why, so do we want like good immigrants to come to the United States or no? Well, the, the, the argument I'm putting forth is that the economic arguments that SOC Dem seem to uh, use a lot rely on the fact that there are a small subset of immigrants that are incredibly helpful for the economy, but that there, there's a uh, larger sect that while initially beneficial for us, I think in the future is going to be a detriment because we're just simply not going to be able to like there's not going to be a labor market for them for them to uh, make use of like their children would make use of it. But they themselves wouldn't. And it just seems like we'd have a big top down problem like we already have right now. Yeah, I understand. Just be exponentially worse. Yeah. We just have to wait and see if that happens. Um, Literally, since fucking Marx, like people have been worried that like factory sewing machines were going to put out of business like all workers because of how efficient capital was being. And that was back like, uh, like I'm pretty sure arguments were made as early as like the 15 and 1600s about stuff like this. Um, but it seems to be that we always seem to find more jobs for people to work. You know, we've always been talking about like jobs are going to disappear. Computers are making things more efficient. Labor is becoming more efficient. There's no, but I mean like prior to this COVID-19 thing in the United States, our unemployment was at like three and a half percent. It was insanely low. Um, so, I mean, it seems like Nathan, we'd still have jobs for people. I mean, if in the future we start running running out of jobs for people because everything is getting automated or whatever, um, then yeah, we'll have a big problem. But I mean, we would have a problem immigration or no immigration. I mean, maybe you'd argue the problem would be a little bit bigger, but yeah, I guess we'll, we'll that, see. Um, but that, 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 that never seems to have been the case before. That, that That's my only argument is that the introduction of AI into like the private sector and whatnot is going to be a problem that humanity hasn't faced before, just in terms of the sheer amount of extra production that's going to occur simultaneously uh, affecting the fact that you're just not going to have the same amount of jobs as before. And I understand the argument that our new jobs appear, but I just don't see how a large enough sector of low in, uh, low skilled jobs is going to still exist for this, uh, you know, this class of immigrants who come in and they have to take low skilled work. Yeah, I mean, I guess we'll but, see what happens. I guess that, so. that's just my only. Con- All right, mm-hmm. I'll I'll stop now. I'm just, I gotta go to sleep. All right, <laughs> thanks for fun. answering though, bro. Be careful. I love you, buddy. He sounds really cute, doesn't he? Just sounds like harmless. Like, <laughs> really, he's a he's a Holocaust denier. So I'm like, that's no, he's Holocaust agnostic. <laughs> Only sometimes, dude. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll still wait for that debate, bro. You can do that later, yeah. Hey, Viv, your turn. Go for it. So last so, question. Yeah, so Destiny, uh, I just looked at your stream and I feel that like you're close in age to both myself and Doobie. You're like on the wrong side of thirty, right? Um, um, I prefer to say the right side of thirty because fuck being sure. in your twenties. But yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, like, I know Doobie's shit at fucking video games. He's probably one of the worst people I've ever had oh, to, like, watch. Mm-hmm. How do you reconcile the fact with as you're progressing age, uh, your, like, motor skills and, like, your reflex time is going down? Because Doobie still, like, kids himself into thinking that he's good at, like, video games. I'm guessing, like, you must have noticed, like, a drop in, like, your skills over the last few years. Um, I mean, I think it depends on the type of games you play, would be my guess. Um, so, like, I, like if I was trying to be, like, a StarCraft pro gamer still, I don't know if maybe... 
Um, I actually don't know. There's so many questions I have. So first of all, I don't know if like that decrease in motor skill would happen if a person's been playing games their whole life versus we just saw like really young people play games constantly because um, because like uh, no older people did because they didn't grow up playing games. So maybe somebody that grows up playing their game, like playing games their entire life is able to maintain some level of skill into their 20s or 30s even maybe. I don't know if that's possible. I'm not sure what the oldest like pro player is. Um, but I also believe that any degradation you see of like your motor skills, like that's probably only stuff that'll impact the top of the top of the top. Like you can still get to like the top of the ladder, for instance, probably by being like a, like a middle-aged person, I would imagine. Um, except for maybe in highly mechanical games, like maybe in first person and shooters or maybe like in starcraft like games like that maybe you'd be really fucked um but for games like like for like league or dota where like the mechanical skill ceiling is like very low um and, and like a lot of it comes down to like strategy and map awareness and stuff i don't know if those are games that like necessarily you can't click the mouse fast enough to actually keep sure. up like they're just not so, as mechanically demanding game types as like certain first person shooters or like real-time strategy games are so as like a guy who guess has been playing games professionally for a while now how would you explain how shit doobie is at video games Okay, I'm 31. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, Doobie spends all like, his time running a politics Discord, sucking up to people uh, online. So fuck Doobie. That's true. Yeah, What's very my, true. Oh my god, you guys are both shit. Why would anyone want to run a politics Discord? True. Okay. Yeah. But fuck you guys. Okay, well, Love you, Doobie. Anyway, anyway, um, wrapping this up, Destiny. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, a thanks, lot of fun everyone. as usual. Um. Uh, if you guys, if you're watching the stream, want to come on and talk to these, these uh, assholes um, for whatever reason, uh, discord.gg slash politics. If you're on the server and you're not subscribed to Destiny, you're going to be banned. Um, his uh, Twitch channel is linked in the announcements and in the uh, the category that's like uh, AMA channel. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, Destiny, check your DMs. I'm Danny. Love you. Have, have a good time uh, playing at Final Fantasy. Okay. I also, it. if you're watching Destiny stream, do be a shit game, so come and play him and like have an easy victory. Okay, yeah, okay. do me a favor and un, like ban me from your server. I'll think about it, okay? Oh, there, hey, okay. email unbans at destiny.gg. It'll go through the unbans form. If you fucked up bad, you're getting fucking banned forever. So good luck, guys. Bye. Okay, see you later. See you. <sighs> okay, we did it.